being here once again. Um, I, for those that are new to this, uh, we kind of approach this in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, there, we published a list of topics to discuss today. We also will have a presentation uh, that Charter will give today as well. Um, we have added mic wireless microphones here in case anybody needs, if, in case the, the panel uh, bench fills up and people need to speak or, or feel that compelled to speak on other matters, they can do so back there. Um, today, uh, we have, I'm joined by Commissioner uh, Mary Pat Regan on the bench and then in a very uncomfortable uh, uh, position for me, we have the chairman uh, Chandler and vice chairman uh, Hatton in staff position. So uh, I'll remind you, I do not have gavel privileges. We won't gavel in and out, um, but we will kind of take it from here. Are there any? I'm sorry. Don't don't say all that like like we're putting you and like we've told you you can't use the gavel or anything. Like that. You made the room assume that like we've explicitly told you you can't use the gavel or something. I I, I get a bad enough rap anyways. I don't want people thinking that incorrectly. Oh, no. You can use the gavel if you would like. Oh no, I did. I told. Oh you yes. Told her? Okay. That was such a so see, I'm I'm the one that gets made the bad guy. And it's you and I mean. And so we're putting the informal of the informal conference today as well. But anyway, thank you all very much for being here. Before we start, um, I do want to start and work kind of sequentially through the list of things. Are there any preliminary matters anybody wants to discuss? Okay. All right. So the, the first two issues, I think, might be somewhat intertwined. Uh, we're going to have, and these are issues that were raised either by the cooperatives in LG and KU uh, or the uh, cooperatives that were released that would relate to engineering, construction, and safety issues of, of the pole attachments, either in the process or the actual attachments, as well as the post-attachment process that goes on uh, from here. And it, if I could invite some of the representatives from the utilities to come up to discuss these issues, and then we'll have the representatives from KBCA come up and um, you know have their discussion. See what space we have up here. But a lot of times, I think we've we've put those is these issues towards the end of the agenda, the last few meetings, and we haven't gotten to them. So I've elevated them to the top. And Mr. Perry, would you mind? Do you want to lead off? Well, I can. Uh, I, I will lead off. Chris Perry, Kentucky Electric Cooperative. Thank you for for having us again. And you know, I, I guess being an engineer, you know, electric cooperatives, it's critical. Uh, part of our RUS lending, a professional engineer has to sign off on construction and, and how things are being built for us to get federal money. We sign that off. I'm, I'm a professional engineer. I've done that job for a while, so we go out and we inspect uh, all the jobs that are constructed on our system. Uh, we're responsible for the safety and the, and the, the standards that we meet. So, so it is, it is critical when there's a professional engineer at every co-op, we, we, we take it very seriously what we do. One of the things that we consistently find, now we find problems with construction with our crews too, our contract crews, our local crews, and we ask them to fix those and we fix them in a very timely manner. But when we're inspecting that and doing inspections on new jobs of attachers, uh, we go out there and inspect that as well. For code viola and national electric safety code violations for uh, poor construction practices. And what is <clears throat> happening regularly right now is we are really working fast. Everybody's working fast to get broadband across the state of Kentucky. It's important. We get it. We understand. But on the other side of this, if you go back to the Ike and Ice report, one of the things that was found was poor construction practices by communications con uh, companies and contractors. We're finding something similar today, from anchoring issues to uh, uh, clearance issues to all those things. And what, what we're very concerned about is that we don't just focus this process on, you know, permitting and getting the, the things out the door, but we certainly got to focus on the back end of getting these, these things repaired. Because right now, until we do our yearly two-year inspection process we think there's significant risk that could be there 
for heavy snows, for ice storms, for wind events that could happen. And when that would happen, what, what we'll see is the, the commission will certainly want to talk to us about outages, outage length, uh, and, and we want to make sure that that gets cleared up. We just think that that is a risk that, that is happening. Now, Sean can probably talk more to the, the post-construction process, how we're seeing that, where it's coming from. Uh, sometimes it's being delayed a little bit uh, for us to get back to that. We're still seeing unauthorized attachments that are happening across our systems. Just about every co-op is seeing this, you know, and, and I, I would, if, if it would be appropriate, I, I would even entertain if the commission and or uh, we're even going to invite uh, representatives, legislators to come and see what we t we're talking about. Or we can bring in pictures. I mean, I've got picture after picture after picture now where we're seeing these things from our inspections. Uh, but we'd love to host and go see and what this does mean. Because, you know, for example, what we are seeing is really the, the tensions of uh, conductors and or anchoring that is becoming a significant problem. And what happens is... You, you may see a poles start to lean in. And what, what I mean by that is if you think of two straight poles this way, if they start to lean in from tensions being too high, well, our, our lines may start to sag more because we were there first. So our, our lines will <coughs> sag down. There's this tight. You put a little bit of snow, ice, anything on that, we can end up with outages and lines hitting each other, which is very significant. Then we got to go find and fix those things. So and that's just one example. We, we can bring a picture, uh, many pictures of that whole thing. Sean, you want to discuss the process, though, of what's happening on the back end and what we're finding on those? Sure. So um, Sean Knowles, for engineering Osmos, representing the cooperatives here. Um, <coughs> so the chairman had asked last time we were here if we could provide an overview presentation of, of those permits. Um, which I don't think we have submitted in advance, but we do have that presentation available. Happy to go through that at, at, at the point where you'd like us to. Um, but to to address your specific, well, let me ask you this: In what, in what format do you have copies for everybody? I do. Or? Yeah, we just brought a bunch of paper copies. Um, um, okay, why don't we take a second? You can hand them out. Okay. We'll take a look. Sure. Look at it, and I'll make sure that a copy of it uh, gets in a record. Or Mr. Depp, if you want to. Make a filing of it. Been trained. I don't know if you the same record. You got a tie on your profession for this handout. Yeah. You knew you were going to be on the camera. That's why you wore the tie today. <laughs> and Mr. Perry, to yeah. your point about the, the request for what I would call, a, I guess, a field trip, uh, I'm going to work with Mr. Depp to have him uh, file that request for a meeting, tracking meeting, so we can make sure that everybody's here. But I think the commission will take you up on that offer. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'd love to do that. That would be spectacular. And, and not necessarily in this meeting unless you all want to address it right now but I, I guess I just want to make clear I, I'm sure everybody in the room or a lot of people in the room have better things to do than to have an appreciation for the details of our regulations um, and then there are some in the room that are looking in certain directions probably know more about the regulations than I do uh, but I just want to have an appreciation for, <coughs> as I read the regulations, the poles have to be inspected every two years from the ground. But pole is not liberally dis, um, defined in our regulations. It's the pole. The wires and the conduits and all the other stuff attached to the pole, um, like technically the electric line only has to be inspected every six years. And so I guess the question stands, in practice, are people, I, nobody's gonna come, nobody's gonna bring the hammer down on you if you're inspecting everything two year, every two years, right? If you're saying, hey, while we're out there, we're gonna do our, our um, unauthorized attachment audit, we're gonna do a pole inspection, we're gonna do, uh, you know, inspect the appurtenances, the wires, the CATV, you know, that we're gonna do everything on the same two-year cadence that we're doing attachments. But that's not the requirement. The requirement is that you've gotta do the unauthorized audit on a periodic basis pursuant to the new regulations. You don't have to look at the wires, but every six years, and you have to look at the poles from the ground every two years does that, um, 
does the fact that you're when people go out to look at the polls every two years, are people actually looking at all the other stuff every two years? That's that's what I'm trying to kind of ask in practice. No. Okay. Uh, let me you know, let me take a shot at that too. We do look for the you know clearance violations. We look at uh, you know SAGs and and all those things. Uh, we're not doing that audit of attachers at that time necessarily. We'll look at it and see if there's violations that are obvious and we'll, we'll repair those, we'll write those up. Uh, but that is, we are doing poll and basically general inspection of, of the system at that time, as well as underground equipment. Okay. So, so that's, so we've got 69 and above, six years for wood, 12 years for, um, Six years for electric line supported by wood. Twelve years for electric line supported by steel or other non-wood material. The distribution co-ops don't own anything 69 and above, right? Some do. Oh, 69 and above, yeah. some do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But not, that's not the norm. Okay. And you all do. And we agreed, we approved in our regulation that attachments can be made to transmission lines, right? Transmission poles, not lines. Poles, okay. yes, poles, yes, correct. I get. I, okay. So I think that. Um, oh, and I, I was going to make an introductory comment, Jeff, and I'm sorry, but this is related to this. Um, this is not our last meeting. This is our last scheduled meeting. Um, I was talking to the vice chairman earlier. Um, April suck at the public service commission. Um, it's usually the worst month because at least two weeks are gone because half the people are out of spring break on one week and the other half the other week and um, every other year at least there for a while we had an LG and KU great case where the hearing almost always fell in April and so April's have just always been terrible at the commission uh, so the fact that we haven't set another meeting is just a function of the calendar as opposed to no intention on setting a subsequent meeting to this but I do think at the next meeting having a from from the poll owners having a practical an explanation of the practical actual inspection like what kind of information is being taken away and what you all are looking at and how you look at it because it sounds like there may be a distinction or a difference and then especially the last year we'll say how does the required audit fit into the inspection cadence that folks are on are you all just adding another page to the ordinary inspections that you were going to do anyways you know the two-year poll inspections or are you doing a separate audit are you hiring people to do an audit because I think it's important for us to have an appreciation for what kind of information you guys are going back into the office with on a recurring basis, um, as opposed to a lot of what we've talked about here is in the process of, of taking permit applications, sort of, oh, we got a permit application, let's go see what it looks like. And I do think that there's, I don't think you know, if it's been six months since you've done an inspection, you can't just go, well, it was fine six months ago. It's, I'm sure it's fine now. It, it may not be. Um, but it also seems like we're ignoring the, in large part, we may be ignoring what we already know about the system through our inspections process and the auditing process when we're, we're recreating the wheel when we get a new permit application. And there, I, I wonder if there may be an ability to find something in between where we're not having to recreate the wheel every single time we get a permit application and we're not having to depend on maybe stale or, or out of date data as well from previous inspections, but there may be something in between that could I don't know, be used in, in doing the permit. So uh, at the next meeting, uh, when we when we notice it, uh, that would be the, one of the big things from the poll owners I would appreciate having is what kind of information are you taking back from inspections and how you're using those in processing uh, poll attachment applications. And just for clarity, so you're talking about the two-year overhead overhead I'm talking about, I'm inspection talking about when, cycle. When you get data from your system, period. Okay. So that would be the six years, the twelve years, the two years, the um, you know post post storm, right? When you replace a pole, uh, how quickly does it go into your your database, right? How quickly do you you know? It's one thing to capitalize it quickly. It's another thing to say, okay, but we know that this pole of this height and this rating when in this place, like how quickly does that get put into your catapult system, for instance, uh, or your, you know, utility facing system so that you know generally what your system looks like uh, or what that pole is. I, have, I mean, 
Is it a three month update? Is it a three week update before you actually see that that pole has been replaced with a new class pole? Um, do you all have an appreciation following that inspection of, hey, we had an author, we have on this pole that we have X amount of clearance between communications and telecom. Well, you go out and do a, not an inspection, but you go out and do an audit, you find out you have three unauthorized attachers in that audit. They've all gone at the top part of the communication space. Now you're, you know, your distance used to be seven and a half feet. Now it's four and a half feet, whatever it is. Um, do you all update your system to say that, look, hey, A, there's no more headroom, but B, we're going to have to send somebody out, move them down. When they get moved down, does the, does the system actually update and say there is any headroom there or there is adequate space? I assume there would be adequate space because you left it. But that, that kind of having an appreciation for how you all are actually using this data and whether it's even being used in subsequent applications or whether or not once you get an application, you're just sending people out and looking at the system anew, I think would be helpful for us in sort of figuring out what we're going to do. So, sorry, Chris. Oh, yeah, I was going to let Sean walk through a little bit of the process. Sure. So, um, and, and I think Chairman will address some of what you just asked through a little bit of this presentation, um, just in terms of how the data, how the data is made available and how it's used and how it comes back into the, the mapping systems, which is kind of a fundamental piece of this. Um, so, I, I'm going to try to move quickly through this pr presentation because because it's fundamentally pretty boring, um, but, um, but uh, again, we're trying to answer the request and make sure we provided the information that, that you needed. So uh, <coughs> the first slide is titled Permit Process, uh, and we have an electronic version which we're obviously happy to, to file and, and provide. Um, but, you know, again, this overview flowchart here is just um, a sort of a schematic version of the, of the regulation and tariff that, um, you know, that the cooperatives are following based on the Commission's regulations. So this is sort of an overview. We'll refer to sections of this uh, flowchart as we kind of work through the presentation. So first, uh, the next slide, there's permits in, um, which, you know, the regulation says should be submitted through uh, designated electronic means um, and include the necessary information. Um, and the, so the next slide, uh, in the case of, of many of the cooperatives, um, Appendix A is an appendix from the tariff that has the specific information required in an application request. Um, the, the designated electronic means that some of the cooperatives use is a platform called Alden One, um, and this is not an Alden One commercial, but it's, it's, it's intended to provide shared digital information that both parties can access. Um, and, and obviously that makes communication more effective, um, and the intent is to make the process flow more smoothly. And, and for the cooperatives who have used this software, they're investing in the, in the, in the software out of their own pockets provide a platform so that this process can can be done digitally. Um, and so several of the cooperatives are using that platform. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, do you have any um, data or, or feedback on how many are, are being um, sent back and have to be resubmitted? Do you have an idea? We, we do. Um, I don't know how well we have exact numbers, but I'll, I'll address some of those later oh, in the presentation. Okay. We Thanks. have some, some of those numbers. Um, and I, I think that's you know, I, I think that's caused for some discrepancy between the numbers that KVCA uh, ha has provided and some of the numbers that we see. And so I think it's going to be important that we, we address that. Um, so it, again, that's the sort of designated electronic means. Next um, slide, again, back to the permit process overview. The next one is the poll owner review, um, which um, is a, a field visit for every poll, uh, an, an engineering review in the office, and then the make ready determinations, which again, I think at this point in this process, everyone is familiar with and understands um, what's going on there. That make ready determination, uh, it goes from simple solution all the way up to an engineered solution, and then that cost estimate is provided um, to, the, to the poll owner. So just to hit on the, the next slide hits on the field review briefly, uh, and I think this is some of what hopefully you were, you were hoping to get from us is how does this process work? So we use, when we provide this um, field review, we use an app called Fulcrum, which is a, you know, tablet-based GIS inspection tool. Um, we're looking for things like, does it match, does the, does what's submitted match what's in the field? Are there any obvious pre-existing violations? Are there potential for new violations based on, on the conditions in the field? So we, um, 
Again, if you can keep flipping through here, we can duck field review. Before um, you keep going, what's, a, what's, a, what's staking? Uh, thank you for asking. So uh, staking is sort of a colloquial term, but it, it's distribution engineering. So it, it, it's the process from actually drawing up the job in a software to actually sticking a stake in the ground to, to denote what's going to happen at that location. So that's, that's how it gets the name staking. But so planning. Basically, distribution engineering planning. It's it's planning the construction. Okay, that's right. So it, it's as specific as this was here before, and here's what the engineer calls for now. So when the construction crew goes out, they can say, "Here's the plan." Yeah. Okay. I got you. Okay. Uh, so as we continue to kind of move through here, the field field review slide. Um, again, the the inspector is going to go out and he's going to you know, see a bunch of pink poles and he's going to turn them green as he goes through and reviews those. Um, and each, so on the field review, I'm oh, sorry, this is a little low tech for everybody, but on the field review uh, page I'm looking at here, um, you can see this is just an example. Um, it's, it, the name is designated um, by the charter OLT, uh, which is a, typically, you guys can keep me honest on what the OLT stands for, but those are the, the, the sections and segments by which charter, for example, submits a permit. Um, and that's a name that, you know, we, we track by. Uh, so the next phase after the field review um, is an engineering review, uh, which is the next slide. And uh, we have to do that review to say, is the pole loading analysis, has it been submitted? Is it complete? Is it correct? Um, and is there any make ready needed? For example, is there a clearance issue um, at the pole or at the mid span? Is there a separation issue between attachments at the pole or at the mid span? Is the pole overloaded? To, to Chris's point about um, you know about ice issues and, and structural integrity. Um, so if you would, the next slide um, has the. Before you go, I'm sorry. Before you go back, Please. real quick. On the previous page, there's pink, green, and then there's yellow. Green is pole complete. Uh, pink, I understand from your comments, that's yet to be reviewed. That's right. What would be the distinction between? It seems like. What, when would you review a span and when would you not review a span? And why, why are there like just a couple of span reviews but every poll is reviewed? So the, the span is reviewed uh, when you can see the sort of status at the lower bottom. That yellow is a span complete. So the, right. the span is, is measured if, if there's a, if by visual inspection it might be an issue. Okay. So, so you, only, you only do a span complete mark here if you eyeball it and you go, that's not going to be an NESE either at the pole or mid-span. It's not going to be far enough off the ground. That's right. You go and you measure it. It was far enough off the ground, so you hit the span complete. Well, it really, if they go collect information on the span, then they, they denote it span complete. Right? And so if, they, if they eyeball it and it is obviously far enough off the ground, then they don't even collect the data. Therefore, they don't hit the span complete. That's right. I got you. Okay, thank you. To the point, Sean, they measure it. It could be by mechanical means or, like, you know, shooting at laser That's or right. some other. Yeah, so they, they'll, they'll have they're a... measuring that height. Yeah. I mean, it could be a stick, or but it could be some radar or laser type equipment that they use as well. Yeah, so they have a tool that they can, that they can set on the ground and it can bounce the and get what's the lowest, you know, height, um, or they can, yeah, they can go out with a physical stick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. right. Um, so the next, uh, the next slide is a sample of what an engineering review sort of encapsulates, what it contains. Um, so this is an electronic picture of the pole here, and you'll note there's a little calibration stick at the bottom. That's a white and red stick that's been strapped to the pole. Um, that actually is a tool that is used to turn the image into an electronic measurable image. And so the engineer can go back and, and use that tool and understand how many pixels represents what. And then they can actually get the, the specific measurements at each point on the pole. Um, and then they can use that to, to inform the, the OCALC review, which is the pole loading software that's used to, to do that pole loading determination. Um, Can I ask you a really silly question? Please. <clears throat> How many poles do you all have? Like, right around about 10,000. 100,000, 200,000. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I just, yeah. just like, rough number. 
Yeah, half a million. Half a million. We've right. got How all the details here. Little... You all requested those, so we've got that. But How much do these little sticks cost? 500 bucks. Something like that. $500? We're in the wrong business. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Highly specialized piece of equipment. Maybe. I mean, so it's a stick with, with just defined distances of red and white on it. It's the ref the ref some reflective. Okay, I just, so the like, LiDAR or whatever can actually, whatever the yeah. technology is actually picks up the exact distance between. Yes. Okay, all right, well. <laughs> okay. Not every fault. <laughs> Uh, so the next um, the next slide is titled "Make Ready" and it has just a little picture of a, of a spreadsheet. You know, it's a report that's delivered to to the cooperative um, from our inspection and review process, and it has you know very specific information on a poll by poll basis. And that's really it's too small to read, but that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. Is um, very detailed information is gathered and reviewed on every poll. Um, and it's submitted, you know, very detailed information is submitted on every poll. Um, and so, you know, again, that makes this process um, useful, but it also makes it time consuming. Um, so the next phase is a staking and make ready estimate. Um, and, and this is important because, um, again, this is a specific solution for, for a poll that requires work. Um, has to be engineered, and then the cost estimate has to be generated uh, by the utility, and then that cost estimate has to be provided to the attacher. And at that point, the attacher can decide to accept that cost estimate and move ahead with the work, or they can decide not to accept that cost estimate and to do something different, to not do the build, to go underground, to, to make a different choice based on the cost. Um, and so that's that's an important point. Is that to go underground? <laughs> just the, the cost. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. my editorial. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you, uh, just a quick question. Um, what are we talking about? Like, what? How expensive can uh, a fix be for a three-phase? You know, let's just say it's already a good-sized pole with a significant number of attachments on there. Three-phase. What? What are we talking about? The, what's the most complex make-ready sort of what? What neighborhood of cost are we talking about for the most complex oh, make-ready? We got some engineers in the room here. So there are people uh, in the room who know that better than me. Um, okay. I've had one that I. Yeah, okay. no, that's fine. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll pick it up if you can. Yeah. We got some talented people back there. I'm going to ask you. Probably the most complex. I'm Greg Humphreys, the own electric ball. Okay. Um, probably the most complex situation we would have would be something that involves a three phase bank, which services a, you know, a member, uh, or a double circuit or triple circuit uh, structure. Uh, they can vary in price, but typically you're looking at anywhere from $15,000 for one pole up to $30,000 for one pole based on what is on it. The triple circuit, you're looking closer to the 30 mark. Yeah. Well, and let me ask you, just, just to clarify, uh, how long would you say it takes to, to do the work of changing that pole out to a higher? Well, there's a lot of variability in I, that. I agree. Uh, one is involving whether or not the circuit can sustain an outage for any length of time. Yes. Uh, you got to look at that. you got to figure out whether the member that you're going to be turning off to transfer their bank over to the new pole can sustain an outage and when they can. So it's about scheduling all that out, and that varies the timeline. Well, but hourly in a day for a crew to do that work. Is Brian Jones on the call? <laughs> <laughs> He's French. He sure. is. But, yes. but, yeah. uh, we have an hourly estimator yeah. built on a four-man crew to do most of this stuff. Uh, we could provide the exact detail, but it it could be sustained in one day. Yeah, I was gonna um, say eight to ten hours. I would. Oh, say. easily, yeah. easily. But more than likely, it'll be a, a, a multi-day project, yeah. depending on also whether the environment, the ground itself, is, is rock or if it's easy drilled soil or not. There's there's a lot of variability in that. Yeah. Just to his point, I mean, it's a very it it can be very complicated. Uh, the the make ready process uh, and just the the physical construction you know, you know in some rural areas and I talked about this uh, you know we will see there may only be one attacher that's there it may be what we call a single phase pole we call it an A1 that's just our designation for that that pole is much simpler to work on when you only got two wires one attacher but you know the complicated structure he's talking about there can take many many days and hours to work on what percentage of the poles have you found to be very complicated? 
Do you have an idea? Uh, maybe back to Sean. And yeah, that, uh, you guys, I would say less than a percent would okay. fall into that. Yeah, small number. Yeah, okay. and I would say that's. Um, it, and it, it depends, obviously, a lot on the area you're working in. You know, a lot of variability there, but overall, small number. Yeah. Okay. So. Good morning. Is it possible to share the slides on screen for those of us online, oh, or um, is this filed in the record that we can pull them up on our side? Um, so we, uh, sorry, we should have. Yeah, we better. should. Have we have it. We we can provide an electronic copy. This, this was still being worked late last night, and so I'm working on getting that filed in the record from the back. And okay. I'll see if I can get a, a clean email to send to someone who can then distribute that out. I might have just spoke on the call. That was Chris Adams from EKPC. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Do you want to send it to me? Maybe. Yeah, I well, can. if you want to send, it, since he's volunteer, if you want to send it to Chris, Correct. he can share. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, send it to Chris. Okay. There you go, Chris. You've been voluntold. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Just here we get so much energy. Um, the, the camera is not on for the commission. Is, are you aware of that? Yeah, it just picks up who's speaking. Can you not see okay. the? Can you not see anyone in the room? I can. Oh, we can see you all in the room. It's moving around. On my end, I cannot. I don't know what's going on, so I'll, I'll dive into that. Thank you. And while we're speaking on technical issues, I'd ask that anybody that's uh, not speaking, please, if you're appearing remotely, please mute uh, your computers. And if you're on your phone, I think star six is what mutes and unmutes on that. So technical issues. All right. Where were we? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep plowing through the play-by-play -play here. Um, so the, after the, the staking and make-ready estimate slide, the next slide is just, you know, we're going to back through the permit process. Um, next slide is make ready payment and construction. Um, and again, as I said, this is sort of the, in the mind of the poll owner, this is an important point, right? Because the, the, the payment is acceptance of the proposed solution and agreement that we should move ahead with construction. Um, and, and again, I think that's enumerated very clearly in the regulation and the tariff that, um, you know, once that, that payment's accepted or the, the, if it's accepted or revised or canceled, we have a decision point there. And once that uh, payment has been made, then the poll owner begins the construction process. Um, once the construction process is complete, next slide is ready to attach. Um, the utility notifies the attacher that construction is complete. Uh, the attacher completes the new attachments uh, and, and notifies when complete. And again, this is, this is an important point to pause on, and um, we had a, a a good number of conversations with our friends at Charter specifically in the last few weeks on that, and that's been an issue that, um, you know, to, to get to the topic at hand, um, the, the cooperatives have not gotten a lot of uh, prompt notice when an attachment has been completed so they can complete the post-construction inspection. Uh, Charter has, has been very responsive in the last couple of weeks, which we greatly appreciate on developing a plan for that, and I won't speak for them, they can speak for themselves, but um, I think we have a much better process in place on that now, um, we, you know, being in conversation on it. But that was something, you know, that's an example to me of we all parties, including the poll owners, including the attachments, have been adapting to this regulation for the past year. And it takes some time to get a system in place that implements the regulation as it as it's calls for, as it's described. Uh, and that's just one example of that where it's taken some time to get that notification process in place. Um, but I, I think we've made progress on that. Uh, next slide is post construction or post inspection. Uh, so again, this is a field visit to verify that the attachment was completed according to plan, um, that no damage occurred during the work, that no code violations occurred during the work, um, and the results of that inspection are sent to all parties so that the attacher can correct any deficiencies um, that were found in that inspection. And again, that's that's important. The next um, slide gives you just an example. Again, this is uh, hard to read, but it, it gives you a sense of how detailed those inspections are because, it, again, it's a return visit to every poll um, because an issue may be found, right? And um, you know, that's, the whole, that's the whole point of the exercise is that um, the cooperative is responsible, the utility is responsible for maintaining that poll for the next 50 years, and so they need to ensure that it's done right. Um, they're responsible for the safety and reliability of that system 
and and so they have to administer that back end process, which is is very important. So um, that, that's kind of a, a blitz through the process there. Um, in, any questions on that? So, in what manner is is notice given to the attacher for a post attachment inspection problem? <clears throat> so. There are a few different ways, and again, it depends on the poll owner that that's done. Um, it, for the poll owners that, that use an online platform such as a Catapult or an Alden One, that notification is uploaded to the platform, and the notification comes that way. Uh, and it's funny, and I, and I suspect Charter will, will be able to speak to this as well. Um, you know, all these processes are riddled with opportunities for miscommunication. Um, if we send it via email, it could go to the wrong email, right? Um, we had an issue that we discovered in, in auditing some of these post-inspection reports that um, some of the people at Charter who we thought were receiving some of the post-construction reports were in the software designated with the wrong organization, and so they weren't receiving the notice in a timely way. And some other people were receiving some notice. And so, you know, again, it's a constant process of working through the, <laughs> the details of these issues to be sure you get to the right spot. And so, you know, it's... It's a challenging process, but again, I'm going to I'll repeat myself on this point. Um, we, all parties have been working toward improving that process for the last year and getting it to a point where it's functioning well. Um, so to answer your question, it's, either, it's typically either provided via email or via an online platform. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Regan's question, did he address that? Did you ask about the time? <coughs> what was your question again? Let's make sure we answered that. Because he said that he had that. You ask about the oh, what percentage? Um, what percentage of um, are not? Are you getting um, per the permitting? Are you having to resubmit? Yeah. Ah, uh, so that's that's yeah. the next slide will be. I, I think we'll speak to that. So it's. Um, so some of the some of the cooperatives, uh, upon reviewing the KBCA uh, slides that were uploaded and shared um, on on Wednesday, um, wanted to clarify some of the numbers there, um, which I, again probably won't shock you. And, and I think that speaks to your question, Commissioner Regan, about about some of the timelines. Um, so um, you know some of some of the permits were were put into categories of polls, age of the poll, and that sort of thing. Um, so we took a look at just the polls that were designated as over a year old. So this is not a comprehensive look, um, but um, I think this gives you a sense of, of an answer to your question, Commissioner Regan. The long-lived permits reconciliation um, is the, uh, the title of the slide. And um, what it speaks to exactly is um, there are several different ways to look at that data. And so what we would tell you is that uh, well, bluegrass is a, a good example there. Um, you know, 544 of those, uh, it's the most extreme example, so I'll choose that one. Um, but 544 of those permits were shown to be over a year old. And upon review and reconciliation, what we found was that um, two of them were actually ready to attach, and that could be a difference in timing, you know, between, between the submissions, right? That changes by the day. Um, 245 of those polls are in the process, but they were delayed because of the delayed payment issue at some point in the process, which, again, I'll say the, the payments have gotten a lot better. That process has improved, Good. but it took time to get there, right? Um, uh, some of them have been um, reprioritized. For example, um, you know, we have weekly, if not daily, meetings uh, with some of the attachers. And they'll say, well, we submitted this one, yes, but we don't have a build date for that one yet. So we've got all these other ones, and we do have build dates for those, so work on those first. And again, I, I would argue that that's a functioning process. Um, but what you end up with is some old polls through that process because, because they're not a priority yet. They don't have a build date. They've been submitted, but they don't have a build date yet. Um, and, then, and then in the bluegrass case, we actually found 264 of those polls that had not been submitted yet. Um, that was just a, it was a misunderstanding between... Um, you know, the, the database on one side and the actual submissions on the other side. Um, and so um, the, next, the next slide, I think, speaks even more clearly to your question, which is a little deeper dive. We kind of used Owen as a case study. Um, you know, a lot of those polls in the, in the KBCA data showed as over a year, 
Um, but every single one of those polls is, is either um, been processed or it's been kicked back. So uh, to answer your question, a significant number of them have been kicked back for incomplete or insufficient data um, or, or, or just you know, errors in the process. Um, the next slide speaks to some of the specifics of that, of that point. So um, you know, in, on these applications, and this is, these, these reasons here are specific to Owen Electric. Um, but in the case of Owen Electric, um, who's worked very closely with, with Charter and with others, you know, we've, been, we've had a seat at that table to observe it. And uh, in the case of Owen, revisions have been required on every single poll permit application. Um, not every single poll, but every single packet that's been submitted have required some level of revision. Uh, and the, the, the examples are below, right, but there's failure to meet construction standards, uh, missing poll loading analysis, or missing data to perform poll loading analysis, uh, transmission crossing, uh, the cost of make ready, again, that the cost of make ready is an operative decision um, that's, that can be too high and requires a revisit. Um, inappropriate make ready request, additional make ready found during the survey process, additional make ready found during the attachment process, an issue with the poll owner, um, and I'm going to take this opportunity well, to, to, I'm sorry, addition, yeah, issue with the property owner. Um, you know, sometimes the property owner doesn't want you on their property, and um, uh, I'm sure we can all appreciate that, and that slows the process. And, and um, but I, I think the point there to your question, Mr. Regan, is a lot. And is there one item that um, you see more frequently for resubmission than these other? So I, I would say the the biggest in terms of volume that we see is a submission that is either missing or incomplete on the poll loading analysis information. Okay. And, and again, we you know we have frequent conversations with attachers on that, and uh, and and I I truly believe that they're working to their best to make that process work right. Um, you know, it's yeah. not a it's not a new fact, but right. it just takes time to get it right. Um, so I would say that's in terms of volume of polls, that's the biggest that's the biggest issue. Uh, some of the other sort of samples of issues are on the next page of of issues that we've seen that slow down the process. And again, it's just, you know, it's the challenge of working fast with a bunch of, a bunch of data. It, you know, you, you, they'll get missing sections. We'll have submissions submitted under a different name. Um, again, poll loading errors are the most prevalent or, or insufficient information for poll loading. And then just unauthorized attachments when somebody fails to submit a permit altogether. Uh, typically that gets discovered when you go out to inspect something else and you find a new attachment that, that wasn't in your record. Um, I, mean, I, I was just going to say, you know, property owners are interesting. I, I would bet every utility in here has people that we've encountered that can be challenges. I had names at Fleming Mason. It's usually us. You, so it's you, nice well, it's, it's no, uh, but, but you guys <laughs> get complaints at times that sometimes uh, seem unfounded and, and even very difficult to deal with you know we we've had you know we do have a letter from an anonymous letter talking about this process and this is why it's really important that we uh work together because we need to communicate maybe poll or property owners that we've encountered that could be challenges for them because th we have a disturbing uh letter that came to us you know threatening the, that's threatening, and, and we know those. We take those very serious because safety of our employees is important, but safety of uh, the, the contractors that may be going there or contractors that may be doing other processes. You know, when you get letters that are threatening injury or worse, uh, we take those very serious. I mean, we, we've got one, we've got, but, but that is a, a real concern for us. It's just another part of this process that has to be managed is this customer relationship that can at times be difficult. Sometimes people go into very remote areas of our systems for reasons. They don't want to be talked to or communicated with. So uh, that, that, that's just an additional complicating factor from time to time. Jeb, I've got a few questions about the software. Go ahead. Mind if I have a quick follow-up on the, poll on the property owners? Yes. How, is it an issue in Charter, you can speak to this, uh, when you get a, a, at your seat at the table, but how often 
do you encounter issues, not necessarily with the property owner, but the, the easement may not be wide enough for a telecommunication or a broadband attachment? I mean, if, you know, I know that easements now probably written very large, yes. you, know, uh, you know, expansively, but maybe some of the older ones might be exclusive to electric service in a particular area. Is that an issue that comes up? Yes, it does come up. I, I've heard some of them. I'll look to see if anybody does want to address that. Uh, Y'all want to address it? <laughs> it does come up. It, I, I would not say it is a common uh, thing, but it does happen when they'll see somebody out on their property looking at the pole line. They're like, hey, what are you doing? And then this becomes that discussion quickly. Uh, so it's not common, but it does happen. I. I I'd say we don't have good data on it. Yeah. Anecdotally, those are the ones you hear about. So yeah. we hear about that on a semi-regular basis, but I don't, I don't have a good answer for you on how frequent an occurrence it is. Yeah. Um, and, and Charter can probably speak to it better than we can because they're often the first ones there. So. And, and thankfully, the commission doesn't have jurisdiction over easements, you know, property issues. But you know, are there issue, it, it, occurrences and where one doesn't know the breadth of the easement? Mm -hmm. Oh. You know, they haven't been recorded. Uh, I mean, I know now in a lot of the, the service agreements with the cooperatives, there's an easement yes. when Division. services, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty wide easement that, it, right. that is required from the owner for it. But I don't know how how recently that's a, a requirement. In the <laughs> Mr. Depp could probably talk about some of those. They get to him from time to time uh, yeah, when I was, they turn into legal issues. I, there's yeah. nobody here from Grayson but Mr. Callahan uh, yeah. from back then in the day. Yeah, okay. Mr. Depp, do you have any? You want to you, you address anything? Well, I, I can corroborate that it does come up from time to time. I mean, and I, I'll second what Chris said that, you know, that may be a better question for the, the charter folks okay. here, um, simply because they're the ones that typically encounter the property owner at that point. But. Okay. All right. You all have any issues, Kentucky Utilities, with finding the easements or, you know, figuring out the Older the, the easement the, records are a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe the, I, I, I don't want to say, never mind, I, I'm not sure exactly how it reads in the regulation or in the tariff, but there's something to the effect that <laughs> the attacher is responsible for their easement. We don't, we don't police that. Right. So it, we have our easement, we provide permission to attach, and, um, well, I mean, I think, I think the, that the it, easement it's issue. not the regulation there. I know that we had a, a, um, an opinion letter, which is worth the paper it's written on, but um, saying that the, and I think it's consistent with federal law, that the, the attacher gets the same easement that the utility has. And I think that's, so that's that's what it is. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Chairman. I finished my question. No, I, yeah. Um, you say it gets the same. The utility has the easement for the pole and then is required by regulation to allow CATV and now broadband attachment to their poles as a cert. Okay, I got you. Right, right. but, but if, the, if, the, if the original easement's only for electric service, yeah. then the, the, electric, the pole owner is not obliged to go and seek to expand that. That's, that's, that's on the attacher to go and get permission. Okay. Um, I want to confirm, going all the way back to the Alden one and Appendix A, that the subsequent screenshots, a number of page pages later, are from that software. Uh, they are not. I'm sorry, that's not okay. been made clear. Um, all right, so let's go to the field review with the first with the pink and green. Okay. What is that software that's that's got the screenshot there? Uh, we use a uh, we use a software called Fulcrum for that, uh, and it's just a is it Fulcrum with a C or Fulcrum with a K? Uh, it's Fulcrum with a C. F L U C R U M. I have to ask after Catapult. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so Fulcrum is it? A, is it a? So uh, the reason I ask this is because two, three, four, five pages later under Make Ready, you say report delivered to cooperative. That's the report from using the data from from Fulcrum. Yes. Okay. So, is Fulcrum exclusively a, um, I don't know, engineering facing database and and uh, technology? It is. A, I would describe it as a, a sort of single purpose field data collection tool. 
It's just okay. the, it just happens to be the tool we use. Right, but I guess what I'm trying to understand, so on the make ready report delivered cooperative, that looks like a screenshot of like a, just an Excel export. Yes. Okay, so that's a report that's taken from Fulcrum and just exported to Excel. That's right. Okay, but Fulcrum, is that a, is that a database that the cooperative necessarily has access to in real time? Like, let me just say, say you're working for, say you're working for, uh, Mike's not here, so we'll, we'll pick on him. So you're working for Bluegrass, okay. and they want to know how much of this, you know, I, I don't even know where this is, Black Ballard Baptist, maybe this is, anyways. Um, so you've got this, you've got this one on with the pink and green. Okay, they're working their way through. And Bluegrass wants to know how far have they gotten without having to pick up the phone. Can the utility look at Fulcrum and say they're halfway through this run? Um, so it's cloud-based and they could. I, okay. I would argue that um, it's not, not a very good use of their time to do that. Um, and okay. so w the way we would typically do that is we do, we do a weekly call with them, in which case we review active jobs. So in, in practical terms, that's how we would keep them updated on that. If right, no, I, 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 and I'm not trying to interfere with your client management. I'm, I'm, I, what I'm trying to have an appreciation is for is with the technology and the database, who is, who is it facing? Who has availability to it to themselves go into it and, and see it? It's primarily on the engineering side. Yes. Okay. So I would say it's, um, and I, honestly, I'm, I'm not sure if Bluegrass has access to this. So again, down into the, to the guts of this, yeah. we would produce an app for this an app within Fulcrum for this particular okay. inspection. And then we would deploy it to a field inspector to go do the work. Um, I, I honestly can't tell you if every time we produce an app, we send it to Bluegrass and say, hey, if you want real-time updates, log in here and check it out. Yeah, and the reason um, I'm asking is, so you've got, you've got the back-end folks doing the field review and then the subsequent engineering, and then you've got the utility that they're doing that on behalf of. And right. maybe the field review is being done by the, a, an employee of the utility, that's whatever right. it is, right? That's right. And that's fine, but what I'm, wanting to know is does the, uh, re the attacher that requested this, mm -hmm. could they also have the availability of information or insight? I, do you, as a root, not can you, do you make that available through that app or have you made so, that available to the, re the uh, requesting attacher? Yeah, so the short answer on that is no. Um, okay. and, and they don't, um, I would argue that one of the things that we've worked on, and we've worked on with Charter in the last two weeks, in fact, is is making sure that we have better, sort of real time updates between the two of us, right? Um, so, okay. they don't have, or and haven't had, I would say, great visibility into where exactly something sits in the process, aside from again the weekly calls that we do, where we provide those updates if they if they want those updates. Well, the reason I ask is so. For this request, just go to the, the pink and green page. Mm -hmm. is, is, is this a single permit application? Yes. So until, just tell me if I'm wrong, until all of the dots are green and subsequently anything that was green that needed make ready is fixed, um, none of those permits are approved. That's right. So it, it's, it has to be done in batches at some level, I would argue, yeah. but yes, that, those are the batches that, that we're working through. And that's what, I guess that's what I'm still trying to have an appreciation for is, and I understand wanting to just finish a complete job and that's how you're, like, but I, I guess I'm trying to say, you know, if, if the run on Highway 62, right, is done and they go, well, you know, that's actually a, a completely separate run. We're connecting here, we're connecting here. It's, it's the same project, but we're not, it, it can be done separately. Maybe the inspection on 62, the field review, shows no make ready necessary and could be attached immediately. But they're going to have to wait until the whole review is done and all of the make ready is done, including any complex make ready, before they go back and can do the Highway 62. And yes. you're saying now in your communications, you are sort of maybe conveying more granularly, well, we actually do have, we've got all this over here done. But we're still working on this, and and you're not maybe. Are you using more than just words? You're actually giving them like visual feedback of 
this is the number of poles, this is the number done, this is the location of them? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, Tyler, you just speak one, one thing to add, Tyler Logan with McLean and Osmos. Um, the, for the, these large jobs like this, you see um, one of the columns over to the right says sections. So they'll be submitted in smaller sections. And if there's any section that doesn't need make ready, that will get approved when it's when the make ready is done or when the, the assessment is done on the whole, the job as a whole. So there'll, there'll be some smaller divisions of those sections that could potentially get approved before the whole job is. How often does that actually happen? So how often does that, well, what's, what's the typical size of a section? I, I mean, that 50 to 60, that, that sounds about right. So it's, it's as often as it can happen, it's maybe one to two sections. It really just depends on the location, okay. like the, the area that 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 permit is requested. In. And then in terms of prioritization, and this may be, uh, uh, we'll talk about the, the KU in just a second, but in ter t is the attacher able to not just prioritize individual applications, but are they able to prioritize or direct what direction they, they request the field reviews occur? So to say, look, we're doing start at this end and not at the other end so that if you get this section done first, we can incrementally move and we're not having to double back. Is so that? I, I guess my... My view on that would be that they submit the applications and they so they designate the groupings and the sections and the OLT. So to, to OLT, extent they're sorry, OLT. OLT, I'm gonna have to it's basically have to. our distribution point to homes. So every two hundred and fifty homes has an OLT. Okay. Okay, so it's basically like a it's a it's a see now you're learning something new too. So it's like a transformer, basically. I mean uh, in, in electric I mean you have to have one every so often to connect to. Okay. All right. Kind of like a node. So, I, I guess yeah. My my view is they they choose they choose the batches they submit, yeah. and so and then they they choose the sections again. You know, correct me if I'm saying the wrong thing here, but so to an extent they they are driving the process from the very beginning based on what they submit and the way they submit it, and then we meet with them on a regular basis to prioritize those those subdivisions of the packets. Right. So. So you all, uh, that's why I want to make sure, uh, you all are even meeting to prioritize not just applications, but also individual sections within applications? No, the application is a section, basically. The application is one OLT or one distribution for us. We wouldn't necessarily go in and say go east to west, west to east within that packet itself. Would you, would you all prefer to have the ability to do that? No. All you all care is OLT by OLT. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. And I, I guess I'll just ask for the attachers. Do you care to have access to this? I mean, not not. I'm I'm over here saying that we should do a regulation that says you have to give them a login to the uh, backhaul data uh, data access. But is there any actual for for your all's purposes? Do you actually need this level of information, this detail of information of what the progress is? Or do you all just care more that the progress is being made in a timely manner? Can I? Realistically, that progress is being made in a timely manner. The and only question that's come up with Fulcrum is more of the post inspection with being able to see photos that are taken within the database. Yeah, we have to deal with that too, right? Uh, we, we deal with that with um, uh, 811 violations. Right, we we have a reporting system, and then every single time we get a, a report, we go, "Hey, do you have pictures with that too?" Like it, it's having a, a system that we can simultaneously get data back and forth and get the photos. In this instance, is is I understand, could be complicated. Yeah, and what I would what I would tell you from my perspective is, I think we need to do, we my my organization, we need to do a better job of of being sure that we are communicating with attachers of where it is in the process. And that's, a, again, I'll say it again, <laughs> at the beginning of this process, we didn't have very good mechanisms for doing that. We are getting to a point where through Alden 1 and through you know, other reporting tools that we have, we're doing a better job of saying, it's not just behind a big, you know, a big wall here, here's where it sits in the process. And so they do have better access to that. But that's something that we've needed to do a better job of. Uh, when you say pictures, just a post inspection question, just for a second as it relates to all this. Um, I think that the regu somebody will tell me if I'm wrong. I think the regulation requires that the attacher be informed of when the post inspection is going to occur. Is that right? Or is that just the survey that you have to allow the proposed attacher to be there? Just 
just the survey. Okay. And I think some of the one touch make ready things yeah. require those notifications. Okay, so there is no requirement that the poll owner notify and allow the attacher to be there for the post, in I, I post think we, attachment I, inspection. I think if it's not approved, we have to tell the reason why. Um, but I don't believe there's a requirement that it be okay. notified in advance. Do you all, I, I just ask again, do you all even want to take the time to send a person out? Would you all prefer the phone? I mean, I'm, we're talking about practical implications of the regulations and whether they need to be updated. This is a good one. Do you all feel like you need the the right to go out and look at the post inspection? No, I think just receiving the, the information back for us to go ahead and inspect it. Okay. Maybe finish your turn. Okay. okay. I, I, could, I didn't know if the wheels were still turning. So. <laughs> they are. I know. Any questions? <laughs> um, all right, so I, I appreciate this, this presentation. Yeah. And Mr. Depp has, has emailed it to me. I'm sure he'll get it in the record so people can, can take a look at that. I, I have no further questions on that you know, particular issue. Um, no, thank you. This is very helpful. Thank you. And so I'll ask KU a few questions, and I'll give uh, KBCA an opportunity to come up here uh, for it. But uh, do you all encounter, you, you all raised, you all, sorry, KU and lg &E raised issues related to, you know, general safety issues and construction issues. Um, do you have anything to add then to what the cooperatives discussed? I think Mr. Perry covered it pretty well there. I would just reiterate the, the, uh, the point that we don't want to sacrifice safety for speed, and we want to make sure that we continue to, continue to work through this process in a safe manner that doesn't compromise safety and reliability. Okay. Um, but I think they covered the, the crux of it. And, I mean, we've talked about in other aspects of the, of the regulations certain things becoming better. Mr. Knowles talked about just the communication in general. Uh, have the construction issues, the quality construction engineering issues, have that, has that improved at all, or is that just still a, is that more of a chronic issue? You want to, I, I can, in general, let me take it just in general. Uh, I, I know some co-ops where there were some initial really prob big problems uh, with even uh, contractor communication with the local people. And, and uh, to char Charter's uh, credit, they, they got that contractor off of that system, which is great. And, and, but it's still, I, I, I think this goes to a larger lineman issue across our industries. Um, it, linemen are in high demand across the country. Uh, I, I think that contractors uh, can, can be inexperienced, and, and I think that's contributing to some of these inconsistent construction practices. We understand that, but, but then we gotta, we gotta get them repaired. So, uh, you know, communications contractors sometimes are working their way up, maybe even to, to line contractors, uh, power construction. But, but for now, some of them we've seen are uh, entry level uh, and learning the job pretty quickly. So, but it's getting better. It's getting better, and, and uh, you know that's where we we continue to talk and have these conversations about what what needs to be done and how this is going. So, how about sure. the number of linemen? We, uh, I, I don't know how, for the, that they have working on our systems. Well, I mean, in general, are we see, still seeing a shortage of linemen? Oh yeah, yeah. It, 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 okay. it, it, as I said, linemen are in high demand yeah. in our industry. We we uh, and there's some movement from different companies and different contractors and things like that, but, but they're still in high demand. Because if you think of the Inflation Reduction Act or the Jobs Act, there are a lot of this federal money, mm -hmm. transmission and construction is going on everywhere. And we're building the new new infrastructure for new, like think of uh, electric vehicle plants or steel right. plants or even data centers across our systems. We're doing a lot of work uh, you know, on our infrastructure, mm -hmm. not only for make ready work for this deployment of broadband. All right, why don't we take an opportunity for about a 10 or 15 minute break and then we'll come back and have Charter talk about some of these issues and then we'll see if, if that horse is, is beaten. We'll move on to some of the other issues we have. Yep. So, all right, thank okay. you. Thank you.
If you're already in, you can go ahead and ask. No, I can go ahead and share it. So here's the, here's the situation, though. And everybody has a copy of this. But um, well, are we back on? We're on. Okay. So when we do these, and this this is probably you all know this more than we do because you all probably actually watched videos of our cases, as opposed to me just being stuck here on our cases. But uh, when these are shared, everybody in the room will be able to see it. That's shared. It's on the you know, screen. Everybody that's on GoToMeeting will be able to see it. But when we put this recording out onto YouTube, the actual document that gets shared during the hearing does not actually... The, what goes on YouTube is not a recording of this screen. It's a recording instead of the cameras. We could, we could do it, but let's just say that it's not, um, it doesn't, hasn't seemed like it's worth the money yet for us to <laughs> invest to be able to actually see the thing that gets shared. Uh, but so after this, um, all, all these documents, even you know the one this morning, will all be placed in this record. And I think the stuff you've all already submitted this, but when you all go look at the video, don't, don't think we made a mistake. It's just when things get shared on these screens, they don't end up on the official reporting. So, Jeff. Okay, all right. Before we get to the presentation, do you all want to talk about some of the safety issues and construction issues and like that? I think we'd like to. Okay. If that suits. Yep. Absolutely. So we'll, uh, I think Heather and Jeff have a few notes from the discussion. I know there were a couple questions that came up and we'll, we walk, would like to walk through that. If Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll start with kind of, I think one of the first things that was brought up was just the overall accuracy of applications. So in the last year, we've actually even changed our engineering firm on the front end to a local just engineering firm that we utilize um, to provide those packages of applications. Um, I would say our data differs a bit, you know, in terms of the applications that, you know, may have fallout or may have to be revised to date within the last six months. We see about a 5% fallout on those applications. Again, some of that fallout is more where we have to make corrections. I think some of that count may be different if there is complex or expensive make ready, right? We may choose an alternate path. We don't necessarily look at that as fallout. We're just changing the direction based on the findings, right, of the survey and that experience. Um, I know one of the pieces that we also talked about was the invoicing aspect, right? So, and we've talked about that in preceding conversations of just, you know, how we get that invoicing, how we have it visible to us, the timetables, and then obviously our execution, too, of getting that paid and paid timely. So as Mr. Knowles spoke about, we've done a lot of due diligence both within whether it's the Alden One system in partnership with the co-ops or our KU um, partners as well on ensuring are we up to date with all of our invoicing? Do we have visibility to what we need? Have we executed on those? And we understand that that may change the timing of how we count our respective clocks, but at the same time, it's been a bit of labor to get to those invoices, right? To ensure that we've got what everyone else has, we can do that reconciliation and we can get those paid timely. Um, so that's absolutely. Can I jump in on the invoicing? Jeff Garrett, Regional Vice President at Spectrum. Um, the, the biggest challenge we've had with the invoicing is receiving the invoice. So we're more than willing to pay, and we know that payment is what triggers a lot of the, the, the future action like Sean alluded to. Um, and so there's no incentive on our end not to pay, but the, the way the system works is you, you have to be notified that there's an invoice. And so we found, like Sean said, that in some cases the notifications weren't working, in some cases, in cases the notifications are going to the wrong place. Uh, we've got an employee that sits in the office that just s searches through the system looking for things that might have been missed. Uh, there have been, um, in, in one particular case, we actually worked with a poll owner and offered to, to prepay so that we could avoid the missing invoice challenge. Um, and so I just want everybody to know that the, 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 we're, we're more than willing to pay and we're more than willing to pay timely. Um, but we've got to be made aware that there's an invoice to pay. And part of the, the challenge there is, is just the visibility. Um, one of the next pieces is... Well, let me ask, I'm sorry. Well, let's just Go talk ahead. about that. Let's just yeah. brass tacks here for a minute. Yeah. So that's why I asked the very specific question about um, what's the most expensive things could get. Mm -hmm. 
is there an ability or a willingness for an attacher to say, um, we're willing to, without having to come back to us ask for approval, we were willing to give you pre-approval for any make ready on a single poll that is less than three thousand dollars. Don't you, you don't need to come to us if the complex make ready is less than I'm just making up a number, less than three thousand dollars, or to say like. Uh, we're willing to spend upwards of ten thousand dollars. Maybe that's your your the place between where it makes sense to underground, like pull in for a single pole, underground versus overground. Right? We're willing to pay up to ten thousand dollars for a single pole, as long as the average across the poles is not more than fifty dollars. Right. So the, that way you know the total cost and not just it's ten thousand a pole. You guys have already pre-approved sure, to agree to pay ten thousand dollars a pole. Is there an interest or a willingness to? agree ahead of time, do all the complex or, you know, non-simple make ready uh, that you need up to an amount for this run. That way there doesn't have to be a back and forth and a, are you sure you want to pay this? Do you want to look at it? Or are you all concerned about, are you all concerned about sort of a moral hazard of if we don't have to look at the projects, who knows what they're going to put, who knows what this poll owner is going to put in uh, that needs to be done when we may disagree that it needs to be done. I'm just curious about your all's perspective on that. I don't think it would be our preferred way, right, in terms of more both from a timing perspective but also, too, just from would that be the choice we would make, right? Is that the path we would want to go per each of those polls? And, and you, you really have to look at not, not necessarily poll by poll but the holistic project. So mm -hmm. there's obviously financials that go behind these projects. And so... You might have some poles that meet the threshold. You might have one pole that's outrageous that breaks the project. And so we might look for an alternate route. We might look for a, a different solution. So I, I would prefer that we have the opportunity to continue to review. No, I'm not saying. I'm saying not that you wouldn't have an opportunity, but that you all ahead of a run in an application could go. We're fine with you doing all the construction you need to up to this amount. That way, like if it's below your comfort level or it's way below your comfort level, there doesn't have to be a back and forth as to the three or four poles that require complex make ready. I just I throw that for you all to consider because it seems like again it's the back and the forth and the back and the forth that is causing all of uh, many of these issues, and if that's adding a month, let's just say it is, it's adding a month. That's a month that you all wouldn't necessarily have, but it's not an opportunity you have today. Is my understanding? Like, you're not. Maybe you all could do it today, but it doesn't sound like you are saying we would agree to pay. As long as it's less than $10,000 for these 500 poles, go ahead and do it. It's definitely a step today. I wouldn't say that that step adds a month. Either way, we've got to pay the invoice before the work commences. That, that, I, that's what I'm trying to say is if you go ahead and say that and you go and, and you know use up to – here's a letter of credit for $100,000 encumbered as you require – but we, for this project, would only allow you to encumber it up to $10,000, and we pre-approve you to do $10,000 work for this line, up to $10,000. That way you don't, the payment's done. You've, you've encumbered the letter of credit, whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing a security out there. But mm -hmm. I, here, I, I'm trying to, it seems like, the, and this is, we're going to learn about this a little bit with the KU, you guys are going to talk about the KU agreement. The more back and forth you can get rid of <coughs> at the application up on the upfront, on the application basis, the less time, less risk, um, and frankly, less um, friction there seems to be in these projects. We agree. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to look at some of these things that just don't make sense to me that we, that there would need to be a lost invoice over a $2,500 complex make ready. And that, that I just, if that's going to add an accidental month because emails are lost, you can't get hold of each other or something. Then that that seems to be worth a lot more than twenty five. That month seems to be worth a whole lot more than twenty five hundred dollars to you all. And I, there, I know that's a sliding scale, and it's going to depend on projects and depend on the other things. But I just throw that out there that it seems like that's something that could be done absent any change to the regulation, any change to a tariff. I'm not going to say would not require a special contract because I'm just. I, I just, I'm just saying, it would not require a change to a tariff or a change to the regulation. It may or may not require like a, an additional agreement amongst the parties. But I just I throw that out there to you. If payment is that big of a problem, and and I, I, 
Okay. And we're still doing physical checks for payment. We, we, we will pay however a poll owner prefers to be paid. So we can do, some poll owners prefer physical checks, one check per application. Some of them want um, electronic payments. We'll, we'll do it however they want it done. They won't bundle them? Some, some will, some, some won't. Some won't, okay. We're, we're open to whatever payment method works. If I could just add one thing on that, on your question there about bundling those. One of the challenges is in the uh, tariff that was approved in uh, December of 2022. Uh, we're required now as a poll owner to track cost and reconcile cost at the application level. We used to do that at the attacher level. And so some of this, um, some of these requirements for what we're doing at this application level is to meet that regulatory requirement to ensure that we're tracking and balancing at the application level. We have to do a true up for each yeah. one. <clears throat> so you're saying rather than at the attacher level. By application versus the attacher level, you, if it were at the attacher level, you could maybe gross it Correct. across yeah. many applications. Would that make things any easier? Well, for, I, I want to be or, careful well, there. It, it, yes. It, in a, we're having issued another state where um, a poll owner is grouping multiple uh, invoices for multiple applications onto one invoice, and it's creating challenges on our end. Okay. So w we can pay uh, one to many but going the other way creates a challenge for us. Hey, just looking for some solutions. There's a distinct yeah. possibility that your PSC may have to do some emergency regulations on poll attachments. So if I start hearing things that are good ideas, yeah, or yeah. ideas, mm -hmm. good or bad. Sure. That's it. All right. Thank you. One of the other pieces mentioned was just really what can potentially create a delay is the reprioritization. <coughs> And really from Charter's perspective, where that reprioritization may come into play um, is really the timing of getting kind of all of those applications back in an already to build status and where then our crews are, where they're working. Many counties have more than one poll owner, right? So we're working them congruently, but for the same builds and things like that. So I think that's where our partnership with the owners and teams have come in for us to continuously kind of speak to those prioritizations. And if we do change the order, it's typically based on what goes in, but what comes back out of the systems, right? And how that may then change the forecast or our build plan. Yeah, so we, you know, we lay out a plan and submit applications in some order that makes sense to us. And inevitably things happen that aren't anticipated. Maybe an application gets stuck somewhere Maybe there's some sort of complex make ready and we need to consider an alternate solution. And so we find ourselves having to change the order of things because of factors that influence our construction. So if you have to build through one area to get to another, for example, and, and, you, and you had the order reversed and you couldn't get through the one area to get to the other, well, you might change your priorities. And so, you know, we, we, we recognize that moving the order of things creates a little bit of uh, chaos in the system, and certainly not our intention. It's simply a byproduct of um, what we can get done and when we can get it done. So to kind of speak to the notification piece of it, right, and we've talked about this in some of the preceding conversations, is that this was an area, I will tell you, Charter was not great at in terms of notifying, right, within the respective systems. Post, post. post inspection, yeah. So post activation of our project, doing the notification that we have attached. Um, so at the beginning of this year, we even changed who within our organization did that so that we had better line of sight and cleaner line of sight to that. Um, and then over the last month, we have gone back and audited from the first rule build activation to current to ensure 100% of those notifications are now within their respective systems, right? So whether that's, you know, a database system, an email notification, however they come to us, you know, we 
we've tied that off and then now have a, a process flowing forward. Um, that's also inclusive of post inspection as well as unauthorized attachments. So um, as the team before spoke to that, we've done a lot of due diligence on do we have visibility into the system? Is our profile within the system correct so that we can see everything that belongs to us? We do that through multiple systems, through email. So we created internally a smart sheet where we ingest however it comes to us into kind of one platform. We then assign that out for correction. We can then track it holistically, right? Then we can also then go back to the respective systems to check mark that, upload that, whatever the, the mechanism is. Um, and that way we have a unified way. We then also bring that into our own database of memorialization to say that within our system, which is called PRISM, that we have a record of that notification as well. So those have been things over the last couple of months that we've instituted as we've recognized that that timeliness and communication has been an opportunity. I'd like to reply on some of Chris's comments on um, both safety concerns and unauthorized attachments. And I don't know if his comments were directed specifically at us, but to our knowledge, there, there have been what I would call a handful of unauthorized attachments, and most of them, at the end of the day, were um, chalked up to uh, confusion on who owned the pole. Uh, there was one example where we got permission to attach um, inadvertently from somebody that didn't own the pole and thought they owned the pole. And that was deemed an unauthorized attachment. Um, I'm not aware of you know, any, any more than, than a handful of unauthorized attachments. All of them have been addressed. In terms of the post-inspection, I, th I think there are two flaws, and everybody's alluded to it. Um, I just want to clarify. I think there were two flaws. The, the first is that, as Heather said, we didn't do a good job initially at notifying the poll owners when we had attached. And so they, if we don't notify them, then they don't know to go do the inspection. And that's on us. Um, we fixed that, and, uh, and we're committed to, uh, to staying current with that going forward. The second piece is we weren't being notified that post-attachment inspections had been done. And so if we're not notified that they're done, then obviously we don't know that we need to go fix something. And so I think we've fixed the majority of that, mm -hmm. I think there's still some that we can't see that we're, we're working with poll owners on. Um, but, you know, I, I want everybody in this room to know that you have our commitment to maintain the safety and the reliability of the electric grid. Um, you know, by nature of what we're doing, our, our contractors are going to make mistakes. It's not intentional. Anything they do, we're going to fix. You have our commitment on that. And so we, you know, agreed to timely notify. You'll tell us if anything is wrong, and, and, and we'll fix it. Um, so I just, you know, just want to offer that up. And of, of everything that we've been notified of thus far, we are within days of resolving. Correct. Yeah. OK. And so let me, this is more of a holistic question about safety issues. You know, you, you know any ESC, uh, compliance and like that how after a build is complete yeah you know, what is the timeline for a build is complete let's say everything's operating normally that you have the notification to the utility and the utility comes back with the post inspection what, what is the timeline for that I think it's uh, it's either 15 or 30 days it might even mm -hmm. differ by by tariff I think it does and based and on then order. I think the, keep me honest I think poll owners have 30 days or 60 days. Yeah, our high volume plan, John, does it say 60? I think it's yes, 60. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so there's a, there's a timeline for us to notify and a timeline for poll owners to uh, inspect. Okay. So I'm, I'm wondering about the nature of, of a safety violation. I mean, are some much more pressing than others that puts a, a poll at in more danger if, if a longer period of time goes by? And that, that that's why I was asking is that, you know, is, is 60 days, you say that usually once upon notification, you rectify it within just a few days, probably, I think it's five, maybe less. Um, I'm not putting words in your mouth. You, you, you spoke on it two minutes ago, and I still can't remember. I, 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 didn't, give a, I didn't give a timeline on that. I said everything we've been notified of thus far, we're, yeah. we're within a, a week or so. Of a week, a few days. Yeah. Like I said, I, I couldn't remember. I didn't yeah. want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. Um, 
And so, I mean, to, to the, I'm looking at cooperatives or the, the poll owners in the back. I mean, are, are there, have, have you encountered issues that require like immediate fixing or is it because you know, there's too much tension to pull, it might cause the polls to, to sway in a little bit that if it's fixed within a reasonable amount of time, no longer poses a, an issue? This is, this is Jeremy Gibson online with Duke Energy. I just wanted to speak to that. We actually have had some issues on our system with over-tensioning. And uh, in the last month, we've had three outages as a result of that. In one instance, the tension was pulled so tight, it uh, snapped the insulator off, and the primary fell across the street. So um, quite a significant issue. Uh, luckily, nobody was in the vicinity, um, obviously, power line coming down to the ground is quite a significant safety issue, but we have had uh, on our system three outages as of late as a result of that. And I'd echo what Jeremy said, sorry, John LaFollette with lg &E and KU. Uh, that it would be the, the example that came to mind for me about the, the issue that would need to be addressed um, most, most immediately, where you have an over-tensioning of a communications cable that uh, would cause it to uh, come into contact with the sag of our uh, electric conductor. But we haven't actually done that, right? I mean, I don't think we've had any emergency, I just want to be clear on that, we haven't had any emergency uh, issues where we've gone out. We've notified attachers of violations and those for them to remediate, but we have not had any emergencies like being described here. Yeah, certainly not recently. Right. Okay. All right, thank you. Ms. Spade. Yes, Holly Spade with AT&T. Uh, I just wanted to say we, we haven't had emergency situations, but we have had 17 poles where there were unauthorized attachments that did require replacement. So just by the fact that those were poles that actually did require replacement, there, there was an issue as far as them being within the requirements uh, if they were unauthorized attachments. So just throwing that out to answer your question from earlier. Well, we've had the same handful of tension issues across the system, but you know, in rural areas, it can be a little different too. One of one of the ones we've seen significantly is broken poles due to the crews not meeting clearance requirements over rural roadways. Um, so we've we've had a couple of those. Get, uh, it could be a tractor, it could be a dump truck. We we've had a number of broken poles from from those events from from clearances being too low which is where I get to talking about some of the construction that we're concerned about. So, that, and that's where that so, whole thing, Chris, and we may not catch it completely. Yeah, I'm sorry, so that's mid, mid span clearance, NESC required mid span clearances over, over roads. Yes. That's what you're saying, that's the, yes. the okay. And, and, and you gotta be careful, you, you know, sometimes you can look at the NESC and, and it, cause it talks about what is going underneath that. Oh, well, that's 15 and a half here because of uh, that's inaccessible to this or that. Not necessarily in rural areas. I mean, think of combines and things like that. We run into those issues regularly. Uh, so, so that's why I, you know, we really push toward that 18 feet on, on a lot of things, uh, just because we know what's gonna be driving and traversing those, those pathways. So I mean, that, that's probably been the, probably one of the more for us. Uh, Greg Humphreys, Zone Electric. Uh, just to go with the 18 foot, KYTC regulates that all state roads require 18 feet clearance to the bottom com or neutral or whatever that is above the roadway. So that's where the 18 foot yeah. comes from. Gotcha. Just to clarify. Which the NESC says if there is a governing body that supersedes the 15 and a half, then that will be the, the number that is used. Yeah, but, so let's go, let's take a step back. Let's just step back. But legally for a second. Okay. So the NESC adopts a stricter standard if required by an additional state agency? Governing body. Well, governing. Says in NESC. Right, but I, well, here's what I'm trying to have an appreciation for. Does the fact that our regulations require a utility to satisfy the NESC, does the NESC reference those other governmental bodies in a way that if actually adopts them as part of the NESC, or would we have to take a separate action, or does the tariff have to specifically state something different? That's what I'm, I'm trying to have an appreciation for. What is this, like, is that, is that technically the NESC? Does it incorporate it by reference or by, I, 
I know that I, I'm not asking for that answer today. Yeah. I'm just saying that's something to think about in the context of are we holding people or expecting people to comply with a standard that's not <laughs> technically written anywhere. It's just done by reference by reference. Reference to a reference. So anyway, that's just something we may need to, because if I was an attacher going, look, the rules say this, and you go, well, yeah, but I, I just want to make sure that the rules are clear and transparent in a way that everybody knows what, what the requirements are. So that, that's something we can address yeah, in the next that, step. That is a legal question. That's that a good point, though. We, we are actually working on some things, and we will be working with all attachers on some clearance requirements and things like that. We're working on that. Our whole safety team is committed to this, and we're meeting with Charter to talk about all these issues. So, so we appreciate the openness of both sides that we're going to take on this. I bet you ask some of the issues that we're having. Okay. So. Yeah, and I, we can put some kind of data behind that. So of all of those post inspections we talked about that we've brought into our system, We've had 104 that have been that clearance issue um, out of about 38,000 poles that we've attached to in our rule build out. So it's just less than a half a percent, right, of what we've seen in that post inspection that's come back to us against the number of poles to date that we've attached to. And, and with regard to notification of safety issues, I think somebody from the co-op is, I don't know, but Sean or Chris talked about that, that you all, and I apologize, you all just happen to be the largest attachers. I understand that there are other attachers out here, and so you, you, you are now the face of all the attachers, for good or for bad, uh, when, it, when it comes to this. But I asked the question because you probably have more experience. Um, you know, have you taken steps to either replace contractors or work with contractors to make them aware of if you're getting notification of addition of post-construction issues? Like we have. That? Through our QC processes, we have to date let go of an entire firm and then an additional firm who has let go their leadership team and developed a three-point QC process post their work. And QC? Quality control. Okay. All right. I, I, I live in a world of acronyms. I don't know why <laughs> I didn't know that one. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Any more follow-ups on the kind of construction, sa construction safety issues, anything like that? Are we okay to move on to the talking about the high volume agreement and the pending applications? Yeah, I think that, so. So I think uh, Jeff and Heather gave some some our, our initial thoughts on that. We may have because we're absorbing this uh, real time, right? We may have some additional perspective to offer after if that's. Sure. It's informed. Appropriate. Yep. Okay. Good. This is Jeremy Gibson again with Duke Energy Online. Just wanted to make one more note uh, with the, it coincides with the tensioning issues, but one of the main things we continue to see from all attachers, and I think most utilities on here could probably concur with this, is we are still not seeing down guys and anchors installed prior to lines being put in, uh, which is should be happening first. Uh, that has or been one of the biggest issues we face uh, when new attachers come in is down guy and anchors not being installed until after the fact. All right. Well, I appreciate it. This is a formal conference, but it's also learning. I appreciate that, you know, to get a, a, a grasp of the actual real issues that are faced with it rather than those the pointy headed bureaucrats hear about or we think about when we're writing regulations. All right. Mr. Ostrello? Yeah, we're kind of <clears throat> seated a little awkward for this, but uh, Jason Jones with Kentucky Utilities, uh, Heather Day and I are gonna gonna tag team this a little bit. Um, I think everybody's seen the presentation online there that was submitted, um, and I'm gonna start out with just the overview of the high volume plan. Uh, it was effective March 1st, and I think the 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 two key takeaways here that that we should all know and understand is in terms of the volume is it gives charter the ability to submit up to 3,500 polls per month that KU will review and engineer and KU is committed to performing up to uh, make ready power space make ready on up to 200 polls per month and so those are really the two key numbers there the 3,500 the 200 um, we'll talk about the resourcing here in a minute and how we've staffed up for that but just in terms of, of the volume, 
that is what Charter has requested, <clears throat> and I think Heather will touch on this in a minute, to meet their timelines, and that's what we've committed to doing and partnering in that aspect. So operationally, our teams have gotten together every other week. We've now brought a project manager, as KU has brought one on board, um, with our project manager and team, right? So we kind of go project by project, or as you heard Sean explain, kind of OLT by OLT. Um, we do have a cleanup effort in Catapult that I think you know, was referenced even in a previous meeting of very aged things. They're not in our pending counts, right? They're kind of in addition and outside of those counts that were underway with that effort. Um, and then additionally, and probably most importantly, is that we're providing a priority to KU to say, in month one, right, so from 3-1, we met on 311 and said, 3100 and change, here's our prior first priority. And it's really based on kind of what are our deadlines, what are those priorities and builds, how far are we into a certain area, right? And then we're layering that in, whether that's RDOF around one or our BAU projects as well. Um, and so that's been a joint effort where we've got the applications into Catapult, but then we're working together to say, here's the first batch of priority, and now we're drafting kind of that month two or second round of 30 days of priority within the systems. Yeah, and then we're working at KU on some reporting to make sure, um, Ms. Day mentioned there that we have each have project managers assigned, they're communicating on a daily basis project teams working together. Um, right now we're developing that reporting to report out on that 3,100 polls and going forward each month to keep track of, of where we are in the process with, uh, with each application. And the other thing that had come up and we had an extensive discussion on was this $75 um, prepayment per application. And it was clear, I believe it was the last hearing, forgive me, some of them are running together, I believe it was the last one where um, it became clear that, you know, this is certainly within the tariff and something that we had the option to do, but we were the only investor-owned utility that was exercising that option, and it appeared to be causing headaches in the process, and so we're working towards removing that. It's not a snap of the finger because it's built into the software, into the Catapult software. So it'll take us a little bit of time to get those changes made, but we're going to remove that step from the process and move that further back to the true up stage at the end um, to remove that, that barrier and that back and forth that you were alluding to earlier, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick, quick accounting question just on that. Um, if, if a utility does work, for, let's just say like uh, nobody in this room, nobody on the call, but a utility does work for an attacher and they, they, do, they do work and, and incur expenses that otherwise needs to be under a tariff recovered from that customer uh, or that attacher um, and it never gets paid. Do, do utilities account for that in the exact same way they would if, like is that just bad debt expense in the same way that if somebody just didn't pay their bill? That is my understanding. I'm not an expert. Let me just state that in, at the beginning. I'm not an expert in that area, so um, somebody might jump in and tell me if I say this incorrectly. But I do believe that's how it's expensed. Uh, I would like to just separate that issue, though, from the $75 prepayment. So that $75 prepayment is the prepayment for the engineering work that occurs. So it may cost $150. Um, so. It was, it was more of a prepayment on that, so there could always still be a bad debt issue, I guess is the point that I just want to make clear there. It's just a timing issue. Yes. It's not a reduction. We're not yeah. going to not charge that amount. No, I got it. Because you all were the only the ones requiring. Instead of the front end. You, yeah. you all were requiring yeah. getting the money before you started processing yeah. the application. Like that was a, 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 I get that. I just want to make sure I have an appreciation for, this is just like anybody else. This is a service under your tariff. Mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't pay for service, it's not treated necessarily differently than other service that, that you guys. Correct. Okay. Um, so for the next meeting, just before you all continue, uh, I'd love to have a good idea of like, uh, for a couple of utilities, if you guys are willing to say like, we've, um, we've built out X for pole attachments in this calendar year. So if somebody has like a 2023, what you guys have, either charge for like a tariff rate and or reimburse seeking reimbursement. I just would love to know what sort of magnitude of money we're talking about here. 
is this 1% of annual revenues? Is this 10%? Of, you know, is this a, um, a unique sort of now all of a sudden? I mean, a lot of it's reimbursement, so it's not, it's not margin. I get that, but I just would like to have an appreciation for that. Yeah, and I think it's also just important for our conversations that we're all clear on. There's kind of two groups of payment, if you will. There's, the, there's this engineering cost that, get, that the $75 was to go to or, or that now is going to get trued up at the end. But there's also the make ready cost. And so we're going we're gonna to work without the $75 and do all of the engineering. But make ready will never occur until we receive payment. That's a much more costly venture to do that construction. We don't want to be out replacing poles that somebody changes their mind they don't want to use. So the make ready, we will always still require payment for that. And I believe that every utility does that. Please jump in if I'm saying that wrong. But that's, that's the standard that for the make ready, we do always get payment up front on that. Mr. Chairman Gibson of Duke Energy, um, that, that same with us. I just, I just wanted to verify with the chairman, um, are you wanting a breakdown of those two differences, the make ready and the engineering? I think that would be helpful. Um, Thank you. I, I think that would be helpful. I, 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 you know, it still goes to this. Um, at the next meeting, maybe we'll just talk about it. Is it still makes sense to write individual checks or does it make sense to have some sort of agreed security and, and work it down and then pay it off and then work it down and pay it off? Um, it, it's, it, I'd love to know who the utilities are that still would ask for you all to cut off to cut, uh, a physical check. That, we'll, we'll get to that maybe at the next meeting, but um, I can't imagine somebody wants a physical check. I guess that's my naivete of being a millennial. So. <laughs> Heather, do you want to jump to slide yeah. three? Yeah. Oh, okay, before we, what, what are the cleanups? What does that actually so from my understanding, and Jason jump in here, so Catapult today has about 25,000 poles like in the system. Submitted. We submit, well, yes. That, that's in, the word, that's the word, I'm just going off your old word, submitted. Well, yeah, yeah. so there are 25,000 in the system. There are 18,000 we agree on that are actual work to do. And some of the ones that are out there, that 7,000 Delta is, they have no name on them. Some of them are very, very old, like years old. They've just never been taken out of the system for whatever reason. Okay. So KU and team are working to get us an extract of that so we can go and do some kind of due diligence and reconciliation against it. Is it was it something else? Was it just old? Was it something started and backed out of? And again, this could go years back. Right? So that could be let's just say, that could be like we we gave you this route, you came back with a crazy cost estimate, we decided to submit a different route, maybe that first route never actually got removed from catapult. Like that's a possibility. It could, I mean it appears the vast majority even predate the rule build out because there's no names on most of them. Yes. Right? So so in catapult there's this concept of draft and submitted. And the draft is meant to be the sandbox, if you will, for the attachers. They can go in and they can play around with routes. They can try to engineer different ways of doing it. And then when they're ready, they submit those to us. Mm -hmm. And then that's when our clock, quote unquote, starts ticking, which causes, I think, a little bit of the discrepancies in these numbers that we've been talking about. Um, in Charter's instance, they are not necessarily intending, at least anymore, to use that draft status as a sandbox, but more of a place for those applications to land while they're waiting for the next batch of 3500 yes almost yeah. like a queue as opposed to as opposed to that sandbox but every attacher doesn't do that right so we can't go in and like look at the draft and say grab those and start working on them you know every attacher has to choose which ones they want to submit or not submit and so these old ones were out there in, in charters draft status and they're working to get rid of those so that the only ones there are actually valid. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. So, but really when you look at the counts that we'll take going forward, they're only the ones that are true and a valid kind of status, if you will, right? So. 
after the purge, or like you all agree don't won't be included in the we amount agree that needs that to be they reviewed. They will not be included in what needs to be reviewed. Okay. Right. So you know the gr the gross total that is within the systems today is just over eighteen thousand. So eighteen thousand eight hundred and twelve. Um, as Jason pointed out, we've submitted that first batch of priority of 3,113 for that first month of the high volume agreement, which comes off, that's included in the 18,000, right? So that will then become kind of a declining balance. Um, what we project to come in state round two, right, of the grants that are yet to be signed is an incremental 11,065 for KU, which brings that grand total to 29,877, again, taking that first month of 3,100 off of there. The exercise to the bottom left was really just kind of mathematically show that as we reached our high volume agreement terms, and as we ramped to the 3,500, that that 3,500 per month in the execution there will allow us to meet all of the respective deadlines within round one, art off, the direct kind of deals with specific counties, as well as what we project for round two. We're using a placeholder for round two of May of 2026, as we expect probably most of those agreements to be signed in May of 2024. We expect them to have a 24 month timeline attached to them. Yeah, so when I looked at this, I, I was very confused about the, there are numbers missing necessarily to make any of these calculations work. So first, is rural amount included in Rural amount in all these, in, in this table, mm -hmm. in all these rows is more than submission amount. So rural amount is a subset of submission amount. That's correct. Okay. So within our systems, right, we, we build to other customers, right? We build to greenfield projects or brand new subdivisions, existing subdivisions that may not be part of the subsidized rural build projects, right? So we have to leave space for that amount of work to come into our systems as well that may not be part of the subsidy rule build out yeah and that and how you all define that we'll have to maybe maybe we'll have time to get into that in just a second but i, I want to make sure i know what's going on here expected ads round two mm -hmm. that is not a subset of submission amount that's an additional it's amount the incremental to the 3500 correct eleven thousand. And, and there's a declining balance which would indicate that post may of 2024 effectively sometime between April 2024 and May 2024, mm -hmm. um, that you all are, that you all, that KU is processing them faster than, faster than um, they're being submitted. Because 18,000 of that total is already in the yes. catapult today. No, 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 I get, I get oh, that okay. you, you have a balance. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly adding to that balance, Correct. but in order for it to decline, that means that KU has to process them faster than you're adding them. Correct. So they're working on the new ones and the 18,000 balance. But what misses, is missing from this presentation is what the expected, yeah, what, <laughs> what, what amount is being removed from the balance each and every month. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I can, I can, you know, I guess technically, step back into that, but that means that you all are going to be processing in excess of 3,500 a month. We are gonna be processing up to 3,500 a month. I think what might be confusing the issue here is basically what's gonna happen is Charter is gonna move out of those 18,000, just, I'm just gonna use the round numbers here, but out of those 18,000, they're gonna take 3,500 and tell us these are the 3,500 we want you to do this month. And so the 18 is going to go down to 15. And then they're going to say, here's another 3,000 the next month, and it's going to go down to 12. And but, okay, so you're going to be, okay, so between July and August, the total amount goes down five, uh, 400 approximately, right? Now you've submitted 3,500, the total amount is going down 500. How many is expected to be processed in that month? 3,500. I think that I think the 27. You, you jump in here. This is your, kind of your chart out of it. The 2766 is being added. Correct. Those are new for round two. So we're processing 3,500. Okay. But they're so adding 2,700 to the 18 total. This is great. Okay. So this only addresses the 18,000 
backlog. I, I, I know I'm not. No, you object to calling it a backlog, but I'm just using it to get to brass tacks. This is only how fast you need to process the 18,000 backlog plus the 2766 for four months. Correct. What if there is a new project that is a rural project that is on the KU system that is not currently in that 18,000? Which is somewhat why we've got a buffer in here of 10%. If you see that rural amount is only 3150 versus 3500, we've left a buffer in there for that type of space. Oh, see, that, see, that's very confusing to me because I read this the first time as indicating that that buffer is exclusively for the non-rural submissions. Each it month. could be a combination thereof, right? But we wouldn't expect to receive a new rural project with that advanced of a deadline, right? So you all feel like you've submitted with a buffer of 10% mm -hmm. all of the polls in KU's territory that you will need to attach to for the next year and a half. We have not submitted round two, which is the 11,000. Yeah, I forget yes. the 20. I'm saying this, you say this chart with the, between the 3,500 and the 2,766, you all do not anticipate submitting poll attachments that new, new novel poll attachments in excess of the current 18,000 or the 2,766. For rural build projects, that would be art off round one or the direct deals that are signed today. The, the, the variable there is, is obviously the bead process, right? Yeah, bead. And, and well, the variable is bead and anything else that comes. <laughs> right. I'm trying right. to but, I guess that's that's but in terms of the timing, yeah. is, is when the, the Commonwealth will get the grant program up and running and when it will make awards of that, right? And, and to what extent we might be a recipient of those awards. Yeah. Because that will obviously but, likely add, if we are a recipient and they're in KD various, but just, just so that I'm clear about how we kind of got to where we're going from here, the 18,000 as a general matter, plus the 11, the, the 2766, plus the 10% buffer, represented effectively everything you guys feel like you're going to need for the next, well, years at this point, through 2026, with understanding bead makeup. Correct. Yeah, pre bead. Okay. Okay, so you all weren't necessarily providing the submissions at, you know, on a rolling basis. It was basically like, here's the pile of stuff we need. And now this is a plan to work down that whole pile, plus or minus 10%, plus the 2766. That, as a general, that like a fair way to characterize it so point, we can yes. understand it? Okay. Yeah, where right. we are today. That is very helpful. Thank you all. Yeah, so the last thing here that I just wanted to touch on were the resources. We've talked about this a little bit in, in some of the previous conferences. And we have, we have ramped up resources, everything from project managers, engineering firms, field data collection, um, actual field crews to perform make ready. Uh, we're actually bringing some of those on system beginning next week. And so I think we've built a framework using the high volume plan that can address the needs that Charter has now and that's flexible enough for us using these contract resources to kind of <laughs> ebb and flow and, and handle the peaks and valleys as things go through. So right now the plan is the 3,500 and 200 <clears throat> and we have the resources available to do that. We actually started ramping these up at the beginning of the year. One of the things that you, you may notice here, if you really dig, these, dig into these numbers, um, there was a ramp up period in the high volume plan. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting some allergies here. Um, <coughs> there was a ramp up period in the high volume plan, and in the chart, Ms. Day actually has there like 1,000 in March and 2,500 in April. But we were ramped up and ready to go ahead and start receiving these. So ahead of schedule, we went ahead and did the 3,100 in March rather than the ramp up period because we were ready to go. Anything else? Any other questions? Any questions? This is really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would just, I think the bottom line here is that KU and Charter have come to an agreement and we believe it's going to meet the needs. We're working through it. Our teams are working well together, having regular uh, meetings with the leadership, 
and on a day-to-day -day basis, the teams are in contact, and we're moving forward. Fully agree. It, you know, and I, I think I pointed out that the charter has become like the face of the, all the pole attachers, but they're not all the pole attachers. What what percentage of your attachments are with charter? <clears throat> Uh, right now, I don't know the exact percentage. I'll just say that it's a very large percentage. Um, we do have a couple of other um, uh, attachers within our service territory that are interested in, in potentially some high volume plans that are more localized, I think, in nature. Um, we have one that's uh, MKU's area, ODP in Virginia, and then another one out in the western part of Kentucky. Um, but those are those are, are smaller plans, I would say, in comparison to the one that we've done here with Charter. Smaller than this, but larger than the, the maximum in the regulation. Okay. Correct. And, and for context, <clears throat> excuse me, we only have we have one other attacher who's submitting under a under that larger order schedule, uh, and the rest of our applications are coming in under the uh, one to three hundred scale. And so when you reference larger, you're referring to 301 up to 1,000. Up to 1,000, that's right. right. So everybody else is actually under 300. Oh, okay. Right. Said, I, I was just curious. Yeah. Can we? I don't think I do. Go ahead. No, I just was going to ask. I mean, this is, this is, I think, a good segue into um, what I assume is your presentation on, on behalf of KBCA. <laughs> um, so that we have an appreciation for it's it's very it seems to be very similar and that's why I was asking a lot of questions of what the other sort of represents in terms of uh, are the submissions sort of coming on a rolling basis and it seems like rolling is probably not the right term but periodic some submissions but at least it seems like maybe you all have attachers generally have a upfront of here's our big project that we need to do the next two years or two and a half years here are I don't know, eighty percent of the applications for them, and then you all have some additions throughout the way, um, and so, anyways, I, I just I, I I guess we just need to get into that because that'll be helpful in having an appreciation for um, <coughs> KU on here is at twenty seven thousand eight hundred ninety five as total submissions. That includes the seven thousand that are in the sandbox. That does not. So that is net and clean of the seven thousand, but. There's also been 9,000 received back. So the pending amount is the 18,812. Okay. That's the, that's the, okay. So that's not true. Um, that's the 18,812 is the 18,000 you're talking Correct. about. Correct. Okay. All right. Sorry. No, that's a good segue. Um, so I, I think, Tom, you're, okay, great. Yeah, yeah we can go ahead and this. So, um, in, in, in our effort to be as responsive as, as possible to the, the Commission's interest in seeing as much data uh, as we can, we put together um, what we feel is quite a bit of, of information related to what we're seeing with each of, particularly the primary poll owners, where we have a, a number of both existing permit uh, that are pending and then also expected future permits. So what you're seeing in this presentation is an overview of a couple of things. One is the pending permits relate to the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, the FCC's program, RDOF. The Better Internet Program grants round one uh, that the state uh, provided back in 2022. And then also individual county contracts that we have with a number of municipal uh, governments around the state. So what we have here is, is sort of that first tranche of that, that Heather's going to walk through of currently pending uh, permits. That's what's represented in that in the in the first slide that we'll get to. Subsequently, but from the 11,000 that you mentioned, uh, future expected permits with KU, we also have an anticipated number, an estimated number of permits that we expect for round two. Those projects right now are in the, are currently in the walkout and design process. So that is an estimated number of permits that we believe we're going to be requesting for the second round of, of grants. So, you know, and I guess if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, I think one, what we were looking at, so it, as, as we were looking at the projects on the front end and 
particularly those uh, state grant projects. The, the broadband office um, requires, in some, in some cases, a 24-month build-out, which is, you'll see in our, as we sort of do a pacing at the very end of this with three different poll owners, we wanted to sort of track back what, this, what the state's grants require from that 24 months. So you see a, an idea of, of what, we're the, what we're seeing in terms of what we have currently in the systems, what we're expecting from round two, and what that means in terms of when we need to get those permits back in order to complete the builds within the contractual timeline. So um, we'll, we'll walk through that a bit more, but I wanted to just have a sense of what data you're gonna be seeing throughout these slides. So I, I'll turn it over to, to Heather. I know we've already sort of jumped ahead to that next uh, which is a bit of an eye chart here, um, but hopefully um, Heather can make a little more sense of it. Sure. Um, thanks, Jason. So, one, I want to walk through that, you know, all of this information has been the information we've been sharing, relatively speaking, whether it's been KU and lg and &E mm -hmm. or with the McLean Osmos team and the co-op team, right? So these are the same counts as you heard Sean and team talk to of being able to reconcile. Are we on the same page? with the respective counts. And so this has been the same volume of work we've taken throughout those conversations. Um, what you'll see on the chart, just to orientate everyone, it represents nine poll owners. Really, we just truncated the list to anyone with greater than 500 polls, right, and a pending piece. Um, so it may exclude ones that have less than 500. It does also exclude anyone um, that is a TBA or municipality, so they're not even included in any of the counts or the charts here from a PSC perspective. Um, the chart and data only takes us through the end of 2024, or February of 2024, so anything that's fluid and active in the month of March is not included here, right? So when we speak counts live on our weekly and bi-weekly calls with the teams, we're always going to talk to current, um, but this does cut off at the end of February just to keep it clean and not have a, a mid-month type of update. Um, each of the relative poll owners, there's a submitted line, right? So that shows what we have submitted into the relative systems and then what we have received back. On a month by month basis, it's not received of that count. It is just within that month, what have we received back? It's not a subset um, of one another as you go across the chart. So I'll kind of pause there. Um, again, the smaller poll owners are included in the total at the bottom. So if you do the math to add up on the right side, they don't add up to what you see um, because the total also does include those owners with less than 500 polls. So let's just, can we walk through this for a little bit? Sure. So we'll just talk about bluegrass. So you had a lot, I'm using technical terms here, a lot in 2022, mm -hmm. then effectively none Q1, just a few in Q2, 500. It really ramped up July, August last year. Mm -hmm. uh, stayed at a fairly constant pace. Then all of a sudden, you know, I get it, folks took off for Christmas. And then January, February, at that more than 1,000 submissions each month. So then we go to Clark. Uh, <laughs> not many. A lot in March 23. Back to not many. A lot in August, September, October, uh, a few November, and then it's kind of, you know, it, famine or feast for a few of these, right? Um, and then, you know, they cleared a lot, it looked like, uh, going back to bluegrass, they cleared a lot all at once in July and August. Um, and then they've, I don't know, they've cleared a few in November. December, January, February, a, a fairly consistent cadence through that time, five, you know, 150 to 500. When you all are, let's just take bluegrass because it's the best example. January and February are over 1,000 polls. It's a, what, 1,000 or 1%, Jeb? 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. Yeah, it's a little Let's just say that their threshold is 1,000. Do you, do you all know whether those are a single application? No, they would be multiple applications. Multiple applications. So they would all fall under each one of those applications. Do you all know whether you all consider or Bluegrass considers those to be small volume applications or large, large volume applications? We would anticipate that they would be considered as large. Okay. So that's, that's helpful because it's like Q2 
keeping somebody from filing two 999 <laughs> applications that are given to us in whatever the time is, X number of months. Okay. Do you all have agreements for, you all have got a few months on any of these number of, of submissions here that would seem to fall under the large volume. Pit. Do you all know for any of them, uh, like Fleming Mason, you all, I know you all have some conversations with them, some, I don't know, agreements, the right or wrong term, but they, you all had a ton of submissions to them in spring of 23. Do you, did you all have an agreement, a time period, an agreed upon time period for those not applications? Not separate, not a separate agreement, no. Okay, how about the, the ones you all did in January, February for bluegrass? The same, not a separate agreement. Okay, well, I guess what I'm trying to have an appreciation for is the regulation for small volume says, if it's small volume, here are the deadlines. Mm -hmm. Then if it's large volumes, it's the parties agree, and if they can't agree, of course, we've got our separate complaint process. Are you all actually, are the conversations happening to engage on, okay, it's a large volume, we see it as a large volume to you, and then subsequently, how can we agree on what the processing of this should be? Yes, I mean, we believe so based on kind of the timetables within the large volume section. Right, that would allow 60 days for survey, right? It's all in about a five and a half month process, make ready, estimate payment. Okay. Um, so I've got, for the purposes of compliance with the time periods in this section, which the section I'm looking at is the, let's see here. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. If I may, this is Paul Warner, and I'll apologize for not being there uh, live with you all today. But just to clarify one thing to make sure that we're all on the same page, you know, an application size is really determined based on the number of polls uh, submitted in 30 days. So it could be one application, it could be 100 applications. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we were speaking the same apples to apples kind of language on that. Well, I, but I, I think that, yeah, and part of the reason I'm asking this is because I think that it's the way the regulation written, it's written, it's not a shall determine that it's the same application in 30 days, that the utility may deem multiple applications submitted in 30 days that are in excess of the threshold as being a large volume. That's my question of have the conversations occurred to what the utility deems to be, one, whether they're deeming it to be large volume or not. And I'll defer to the, the folks at the table on that factual okay. question. I just okay. want to make sure we were speaking the same language, so yeah, thank and you. I just, and that's why I'm asking you, it's, it's a utility shall require negotiate in good faith the timing of all requests for attachment larger than the lesser of a thousand poles or 1.5% of the utilities poles. And that's why I'm asking, like, is the conversation happening when the 30 days are going and the thousand poles are provided or the 1.5% is in there? Is that conversation actually happening about, okay, this is a single application, let's figure out a time period is it, are you all deeming are you all determining that time period we are not okay. no you're not involved like that conversation isn't happening no. necessarily okay so i guess i guess it's a chicken and egg situation how can it be late how can something take too long if the time period for determining how long it's supposed to take has not been determined as a sort of, a, okay. Do you, I was asked a very direct question. Do you all feel like you're put in a position where you can't claim, you can't file a complaint with us that something is late if you all haven't come to an agreed upon time period that it's exceeded? No. I wouldn't no. say that. I wouldn't. Okay. So, um, for 300 poles, you can add 15 poles, uh, you can add 15 days, you can add the 45 days. What is a good time period to do, I don't know, 1,200 poles? That's what we have to figure out, right? We've deemed time periods for the lesser of the 1.5 or the 1,000 or, um, you guys have thrown out 
3,000 as being a number. I still don't have an appreciation for what the time, what a reasonable time period for 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 ought to be, but I also don't have an appreciation for like, what's a reasonable expectation if a utility got zero in one month, 1,500 in the next month, and then zero again in the subsequent month, should, it, should that play into it at all? Because if a, that's very different than a utility that got 1,500 three months in a row. Um, I mean, do y'all have any thoughts about that? Like how, how, how we could say we got we just got 4,500 in three months in a row as opposed to the utility next to the same size and everything. It says, you know, we got 1,500 one month, but we only got it one of those three months. Should, there, should that matter in coming up with a time period like this negotiated time period on how to process this? Should that necessarily matter if it's the same attacher? I don't know that it should. I think, you know, and you can see, obviously, as these ebb and flow, because our goal is so that there's full visibility, we're going to put the whole project in, mm -hmm. right? And so now if that negotiated then timetable, to your point, right, if it, it falls above 1,000, it should be renegotiated, if you will, right? But our view is that it's within a reasonable amount of time of that large order because collectively within the quarter, if you will, it kind of meets that standard. So said differently, we, mm -hmm. if you look at January of 24 for bluegrass, the number is 1107. In theory, we could have held 107 until a future month. But it doesn't negate the fact that the 1,000 isn't necessarily getting completed per the existing timelines. So there, I mean, there are clearly instances here where we're under the 1,000, but we're still not meeting the timelines. You're asking about what happens when we're over? Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know that they're separate projects or if like the 6 in May of 23 were were <coughs> unidentified and missed polls that related to the submission in April to, you know what I mean? I don't know that they're individual, that they're new projects or new applications as much as they may be related to the project that was submitted the month before. That's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to make all this work and it's, I, I worry that after looking at this this week, <laughs> Well, I, mean, I, have less, I have less answers than I thought I did on like Monday. I guess it, I guess it depends how you define a project. It does. And I think it, it depends on what you define as an application and what you define as a project. If you talk about art off or in year we talk about bead, is the project the whole thing, or is it a component? And so you know we did our best to put in um, as much as we could as soon as we could. Yeah. Um, rather than hold it all until the end. And so if you think about ARDOF, if, if we had to wait until all the upfront work was done before we submitted, we'd be much further behind than we yeah. are. And so we're submitting, again, I think it comes back to how you define a project, but we're, we're submitting as, as we get the work ready to submit. <coughs> Do you all know of an instance where you've submitted an application that under the regulation is falls under the 7D for a request for attachment larger than the lesser of 1,000 poles or 1.5% of a utilities poles? You all feel like you've submitted that to a utility? Ask the question again? Yeah, okay. So do you all feel like you've ever submitted an application that would fall under that provision? Under the large order? Yeah, yeah, that, that shall negotiate language. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you all know of an instance where you actually negotiated the timing of all the requests in that attachment larger than the lesser of, no. with the exception of the large volume contract you've got with KU? No. Not specifically. But again, I'll answer the question you didn't ask, which is there, there are a lot of instances where we submitted not a large order that we're still yeah no I it, it doesn't say the attacher shall negotiate good faith it's I'm, I'm don't take my question as being you know uh, derogatory to anybody I'm just asking do we have a regulation that is actually helping is what I'm really asking um, we can set all the standards we want but is there anybody actually okay and I get what you're saying you've you've given an application for six before did it fall under the a B or C there and that's the okay. Yeah, That's the question. Just one more point of clarification, and it may be obvious, but 
the six, for example, of May of 23 for bluegrass doesn't necessarily constitute a project. It, it, it might, might be multiple projects. It might be pieces of a project. It, it certainly constitutes an application. So that's the thing is our, our regulations, I don't think, envision a distinction. I don't think they envision a project, however that is defined. I mean, do you know that it says pro I mean, I think it's talking about the submission of applications and the processing of those applications because I think that the anticipation was that for the 40 years or 50 years we've done CATV attachments, the utility has been basically ignorant or indifferent of what the attacher's project is. It's just you tell us you want to attach, we figure out whether you can attach. Here are the rates and charges in terms of service. Um, do you all talk to the folks in the context of projects or in the context of applications? When you're talking to the whole owners? Applications, right? And so okay. one project on our end may be an application that has an A, B, and C. And so we may talk that this one has three groupings yeah. together, right? And when we prioritize them, we may prioritize those three in total, right? Um, but we'll talk in terms of applications. Or as kind of Sean pointed out earlier, OLTs, which would be our sub our build. Yeah. Right. Sub portions of a single right. application. But when we, when we, going back, and I'm glad you'll have the agreement, but let's, it's, it's handy that you'll have the agreement because now we can sort of just use KU as the example. If, if, you, if you all submitted for 600 homes or for 600 poles in Harlan County for RDOF, that's a project for you all. Mm -hmm. Are you all considering all of RDOF a, RDOF a project or would you consider like a build out in Harlan to comply with RDF and a build out in Wycliffe to comply with RDF as two separate projects. They would be separate. I mean, our project level will even go more granular than that. Okay, right? uh, yeah. that's great. But like just those two. Mm -hmm. And then Scott County is a project. Bourbon County would be a project. Whatever other county agreements you will have would be projects, individual projects, right? But you may have multiple submissions of applications within one of those projects. Absolutely. But if the utility looks at this was the KU was saying, look, we look at a utility may treat multiple requests from a single new attacher as one request if the requests are submitted within 30 days of one another. So if you all have a, a bluegrass is a great example because they have a, a separate territory. Like they have a Scott County up here and like a Jessamine County down here. Those could be two completely different projects for you all. Mm -hmm. It could be one could be the Scott County contract and the Jessamine County could be an RDOF build out, two completely different projects, two completely different subsidized funding programs. If you all submitted those within the same month to Bluegrass, they could treat those as, could under the regulation, treat those as the same application, or they could treat them separately. And if it's over a thousand poles, and I'm just using that as an example because they have a bifurcated, other than KU, the, the most prominent bifurcated system. system that thousand could apply or the thousand could not apply, but are you all having that kind of conversation with individual utilities? And it sounds like you're not necessarily. Yeah. And your all's preference is to have that conversation so that you all could provide input and negotiate the time periods? I would think so. I think it's more of just are we aligned in the timetables of each of those individual applications, but more at an application versus the application and the month in total. Because to your point, we could submit Madison County and Jessamine County and Scott County for one utility, but they're very different projects, right, with different timelines. One may need to be done in March, and the next one may need to be done in August. You all gave them the applications at the same time, but that doesn't mean that the projects are in the same time period. And more than likely, we've submitted them to multiple poll owners in the same county at the same time, right, because we've walked it out together. And they may be using co-located it may go KU poll, 18T poll, back to KU poll. Yeah, okay. <coughs> are the, t this is a question for anybody in the room. Are the time periods in the regulation a reasonable, let's just forget the 1,000 or 1.5 1. in excess of that. For the attachments below that, are they reasonable time periods? Are they workable? I forget reasonable. That's to, to, uh, subjective. Are they physically workable time periods? Uh, I would argue that it depends a lot on the utility, and I think you get on an important point. Uh, 
I would argue it depends a lot on the utility. I think you did an important point about how prepared is the utility to, to scale up to yeah. process those versus not prepared. Versus, and again, to the extent that the ongoing conversations make them aware, it's very helpful. Does it matter from a utility that they get 1300 in one month, or would there, the preference be for them to get, and I, I, I'm not saying that you, but the preference would be to get 250 for five months? The preference would be to get 250 for five months. Even, even if you get the 1250, you know you've got six months to do them. You, you, maybe you agree you've got six months to do the 1250, and you don't expect for that attacher to bring you any more. You still think the preference would be to get the 250 on a rolling basis? Practically speaking, it would be. You have, you know, the, the utilities, and they're grappling with this now, have to get a construction crew in to do the make ready, and they have to keep that crew, and if they don't have work, they lose the crew, and then they have to get them back, and those types of things. Okay. can't start working any of these until you get the application. Okay. As a practical matter, it doesn't seem like anybody's using, if the attacher does it, nobody's using the <laughs> attacher survey. Is, that, is anybody using the attacher's surveys? Okay. Have you all just stopped doing the surveys up front? You just, oh, for the most part? Oh, call time. Hmm? No, we have not stopped doing the surveys. We still okay. submit them, whether it's to Alden One or within our package to catapult and the like. What are we, I mean, and I'm sorry to like take all the air in the room. What are we missing here? I feel like we're, it, there's, it's, our regulation doesn't, I think that we thought our regulation was addressing what the expected issues are here, but it seems like it's not actually I don't know, not, not, uh, maybe not being used, not being, imp imp I mean, not helpful for the, I mean, it, do we just need to do ad hoc, require people to do ad hoc special contracts with each pole owner and each attacher if it's going to be over a certain amount? Like, should that, should it, instead of doing this shall negotiate thing, should it be if it's over X amount of poles, you shall engage with and submit a special contract to the commission that dictates what's going to happen and how the applications are going to work and how they're going to be processed? I, I, I don't expect you all to necessarily have the answer to that today, but I mean, if, if the, ex so look, the expectation was, and I, I can say it, the expectation I had when I read these regulations is there was going to be a separate agreement pursuant to that provision. It didn't necessarily have to be a special contract, but it would be an agreement specific to the terms of the regulation in compliance with whatever the tariff terms were. But if nobody's actually negotiating, should then, should by dictating it be a special contract submitted to the commission for review, approval, stamped, received, whatever it is, if you require a written contract and agreement on the time periods for any of these that are submitted, does that give you all firm deadlines as opposed to hopes and wishes? And does that give the utility then a clear runway of what your all's expectations are and what their expectations are to be able to ramp things up and ramp things down? So, uh Good afternoon, Mike Chuanik from Charter. Todd, if you could take us back <coughs> one slide. Because um, I think, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, one of the questions ties back to, are we kind of all working within a shared understanding of what the agency's current regulations would likely achieve, right? So when you look at the small order and large order time frames that we've got on screen, granted they're an estimate, right? And granted, you in theory could pad those numbers based on the conversations we've had earlier. An application's incomplete, right? Something needed to get reworked, right? But as we were doing our build out assumptions, right, we worked those types of time frames into our assumptions, right? Knowing that there was obviously going to need to be some variability in there. And I think part of what we're struggling with, to be candid, is as we look at the existing regulations and a reasonable assumption of what those time frames entail, they're, they're not being operationalized, right? So, so that's, and you, you spoke to, and I want to kind of throw a wrench in your earlier comment, you know, you asked the question about us coming to you with complaints, right? Part of the challenge that we even 
have struggled with, and I think this got touched on earlier or at a previous meeting, is in theory your existing <coughs> regulations contemplate that a complaint process could take up to 360 days. I'm not saying that that's what you would do, right? But so as we're sitting here trying to problem solve, right, we're looking at that and saying, okay, and we, we talked about this earlier. I think what we've achieved with KU is an illustration, setting the high volume agreement concept aside for a second, it's that informal dialogue and problem solving, right, that's, that's most effective. So if we come in here with a complaint, you know, you asked the question earlier, first of all, we were kind of a little bit concerned about the time frame, but then also kind of the formality of litigation, right, and, and, and that framework. Well, let's just be very clear. It's the other, there's a telecom complaint statute, is there anything? If, uh, or regulation? For interconnection, complaints relating to interconnection, yeah. So That's other than that, thing. every other complaint that would ever have to be filed with the commission has no deadline, we don't even have to take it up. So I know that you all read it as saying it could take up to a year, yeah. but it was written with the intention of you have, you're the only people with a deadline that we'd have to rule on. Like that's a, we could have just said, go use the regular complaint process that exists in rate. It's the only complaint that the commission has that has a deadline in it. So I, I know that you all looked at it as a, a bad thing that it could take up to a year. Sure. I think we intended on meaning it, it would, would be processed quickly and that we would have an outside deadline of actually processing it. But I understand the, the, but I guess what I'm trying to have an appreciation for is, A, not all utilities are the same, which I think the regulation acknowledges in the 1.5% language. But a utility may very well be able to process a thousand applications over a January to December timeframe, right? A thousand per month for 12,000 in a year that would inherently be different than that exact same utility with the exact same resources getting 12,000 poll, uh, an application for 12,000 polls in January. Because then that person, that, that entity would have to ramp up in January to process those, process those in three months. Whereas they may very well be able to do a thousand submissions a month and do each one of those applications and process them in three months. And I think what I'm trying to have an appreciation for is, is it the peaks and the troughs? And I think it is. It's the peaks and the troughs that are causing the problems. If you look, though, at the numbers that are coming back to us, mm -hmm. they're also inconsistent. So you would think that if... You know, Sean's point was we want consistent volume because we have to hire resources, we have to hire contractors, we want to do the same amount of work every month. But that's not what we're seeing in the numbers coming back. So regardless of what goes in, maybe 12,000 goes in in January, maybe 1,000 goes in every month from January to December, we're not seeing consistency in what's coming back. Consistency in time frame and numbers or consistency across the board? Both. Both, okay. Both. So you're, you're asking about the over 1,000. I think it's a good question. I, I don't know that I have an answer right now. I think the larger problem is the majority of what you see here is under 1,000, and we're still not hitting the prescribed timelines. And if we dumped, let's just say, 10,000 into their system, right, then, Jeff, to your point, okay, so... A, there could have been a ramp up in staffing, that's fair, but then you would also see to Jeff's point, okay, so now on a incremental basis, on a monthly basis, you've brought in a team, you know you have the work, because mm -hmm. the 10,000 is sitting there, you're gonna have to process it. Why wouldn't we see 300 or 400 or 500, some predictable amount, right now that you see all the numbers, you've brought in staff, and now you're Kind of managing on an on a uh, even monthly pace, right? That that's not being suggested in the data. So, if yeah. I might ask a couple of things here, I, there's a there's a a premise in this data that I think we're all working off of that might be causing some confusion, and that is a connotation that age is associated with being late. In other words, we talked this morning and there were a number of items that were listed
from quality of application, payment, you know, a whole host of, of issues that might cause a back and forth and cause a delay in the process. I mean, I would argue that the rough time frames that were on that previous slide are being operationalized when you take into account those other items. Remember, I mean, we're, we're counting based on this chart. You're counting, you're, us, you're using Charter's clock, their internal clock. So for just as an example, if you look at Kentucky Utilities in January of 23, Charter says that they submitted 1,783. Well, they weren't, per the reg, allowed to submit more than 1,000, right? So these may have been in catapult in that draft status, but they were not, quote unquote, technically submitted and being actively worked by KU. And so I think what we see here is a, a, a difference in nomenclature and this, this connotation then between um, age and that making something late. I mean, I think that our data would show that some of these applicants, some of these applications or this number of polls may be that, that old, but they may not be late. I mean, we just had a conversation around reprioritizing I, I, work. I don't know for what the questions I was asking, and I appreciate what you're saying, especially for the sub thousand. Yeah. But I don't know for my questions that I was necessarily implicating that they were late as opposed to if the applications are technically over a thousand or over the 1.5%, 1 1 whichever is smaller, that if there's never a time period ascribed to them, it can never be on time nor late mm -hmm. because it's just not, it doesn't have a time frame ascribed to them. I also don't know, I, I understand completely what you're saying, right? And that this isn't, that may matter to other people, it doesn't necessarily, I, I the small P sort of, well, I, that, I, I get what you're saying. I, I do though, for the purposes of what I'm trying to figure out uh, under this, whether it's late under the regulation or not, it nevertheless has defined time frames that the service needs to be provided mm -hmm. and how we appropriately ascribe blame doesn't necessarily matter as much as responsibility. And so if the holdup is here or here, it doesn't matter as much of what was the Who is the is the is the response is the um, are the parties clearly ascribed their appropriate responsibility under the law, um, and so if if people are filing one thousand attachment applications every single month, <coughs> thousand and one, and that's the threshold, that's the lesser, okay, and nobody is having a conversation about how quickly the application has to be processed that's a problem under the regulation. There is the separate issue of there's a public, member of the public, as the uh, you know, the provision of service to or for the public for compensation, is a member of the public demanding a service that is seeking to get that service in a timely manner or in a non-discriminatory way under the rules and regulations of the commission, including the utilities tariffs, and is there a way to provide that service within the time frames demanded by the customer? Like to me, this is no different than industrial commercial customers coming in and saying, hey, we need you to hook us up and the utility doing that in a three week manner or the utility taking three years to connect them and you know, either dragging their feet or they can't find a transformer or they have to build a new transmission line, whatever it is, the same, it's, the same, it's, a, it's a service at the same time, right? So I appreciate what you're saying, but at the same time, if the customer demands or requires service within a defined time period, I think the onus is on us. It's going to be legally on us here. If, if the joint resolution, certain joint resolution, get, the, the onus is on us to figure out how to timely meet that requirement for service. And to your point, make it clear what is and is not late, I think is what you're saying. But it's not clear based off the fact patterns that it provided to us whether things are on time or late or whatever they are under the terms. I think my issue is our regulations may be 
inconsistent with the way in practice both attachers and poll owners look at the particular issue and uh, mr chairman uh, again this three? is uh, oh. this is paul warner if i go can ahead just, paul. just to be clear our our position as, as attachers is that the the timelines in the regulation apply whether or not the attacher and the utility actually discusses them. I mean, they are there, they are freestanding, they're positive law. Um, while there may be situations above, of course, beyond what the um, timelines uh, touch on, the, the timelines from our perspective apply irrespective of whether we negotiate um, compliance with them. Yeah. I think, Mr. Chairman, the other thing that bears consideration, and, and this, I know this isn't operational consideration, but it's materially relevant, right, is that the discussion, I believe, Heather and, and Jeff, on the draft application status was a uniquely KU phenomenon, right. right? So just to be clear, that is kind of uniquely in that space. It's not relevant to the other poll owners, right? We're inputting applications and they're being kind of clocked on that basis. There is no there's draft just, status. There's not a status differential. Yeah. And the other thing I would know, and I don't know, Heather or Jeff, if you're comfortable kind of speaking to this, but I think our working assumption is is that we're generally filing applications that are complete and well-reasoned. And yes, things take a certain amount of workout, but that workout is within some reasonable time period. And I don't know if you guys want to kind of characterize that because I think that's, it's kind of relevant. If you add a padding to the timeline, what does that look and feel like? I don't understand what you're Meaning, if, 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 as people are saying, we're filing applications and folks are being kind of guided by a certain time frame, based on the fact that we have to inevitably work out some applications, how much time is really being used to work out those applications? It's not six months. No, I wouldn't say it's six months. I don't have data in front of me that tells us how long it is. I, I would imagine that some are more complex and some are easier. Um, Yeah, what, what Paul articulated, and I think I'm trying to articulate, is there are many instances on this page where we've not exceeded the threshold, and so there are defined timelines, and those are not being met. Mm -hmm. And do you all have an appreciation for, in your status meetings, what the reason they're not being met is? And does that matter to you all, frankly? Um, it does matter to us, and we've had lots and lots of meetings um, with poll owners and with the folks at McLean. Um, I think it's, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I think it's been a slow ramp and potentially a lack of resources. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, Chris, you may, this may be best for you. So do you represent, and you don't have to tell me which one, <laughs> but there's Bluegrass, Clark, Fleming, Inter, Owen, Salt River, and Shelby. Do you represent any of those? We do represent some of those. Okay, so just just to be, don't tell me who. Get details later, maybe. Um, can you provide any color as to why maybe there is this? Hey, here we got a thousand done last month. We got seven done this next month. We got four hundred done the next month. Zero the next. Uh, why? And I'm making up those numbers, but why there may be a sort of a staccato uh, um, received or approved, I guess, in, in, from your all's perspective? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, so we can, provide, we can provide data, and I talked with Heather and Jeff about this. So, um, you know, again, not, to, not to, to be disagreeable, but we don't, agree with the, we don't agree with the timelines and Charter's internal data of when an application is considered submitted. So I would say we, would, we have reached, uh, I think, a good shared understanding with them of, of the total universe of polls um, what I would say we don't have an agreement with is the timeline during which those polls are considered submitted. Yeah, and I, I so. Frank, and I, I understand that to me, and for the purpose of this question, the question is more around the received line. And from the received line, that's received for their perspective, approved from the utility perspective. Right. The sort of variation, do you all disagree that the, there's the variation amongst the months? And if so, which it sounded like you did a second ago, and if so, is it the resources, and if it's the resources, is that on 
Is that on the receiving, reviewing, processing? Is that on the field reviews? Is that on the make ready? So I, I think it's uh, a combination of things and a lot of the things that I mentioned before, right? It is, um, it is a combination of resources on both sides. It's a combination of coordination issues on both sides. It's a combination of payment on both sides. It's a combination of materials. It's a combination of, uh, you know, contractor availability. It's a combination of, of all those things that both parties, both sides, uh, you know, attachers and pole owners have been working to improve across the last year. Um, so, for instance, let's just say like if there was somebody with, I don't know, they went from no poll, this on this chart, zero received the month before, a thousand received the month after. Mm -hmm. That could be like payment for the approval and payment of the engineering, and that would have, that you're saying that's one of them, but it also could have just been, we didn't get it done. Right. We finally got them out. It's yes. Okay. And and it could be, um, yeah. I mean, likely it's it's a combination of all those things, right? Some you know, payments came through, some things got prioritized and worked. I, I think one, you know, one argument I would make that I think everyone would agree with is that, um, you know, as, as you've been asking, it's hard, it's hard to get in the data and, and confirm that we've met or not met the regulations. Um, For any particular application. Right. Um, and, and in place of that, what a lot of Whole owners and charter, to their credit, have been doing is meeting on a regular basis to to coordinate and touch base on priorities. It is the this is one of the reasons I was asking the question earlier about your presentation on is the uh, what was it fulcrum is that a utility facing or even attacher facing program. Are there any utilities that necessarily provide, without having a conversation, provide to the attacher a status change between survey, well, when the survey has been concluded? Do you all? So I'll, I'll, I'll let them answer that. And they, I mean, Does anybody tell you all the survey has concluded, the survey has begun, or the survey has concluded? We, we've, we've had, tell me if I'm off, we've had challenges with the data seeing where an application is in the, in the process. Yeah, no, I'm not even asking like, do you have a, uh, like a pizza, uh, like a pizza hut tracking, it's in the oven, it's, you know, it's out, putting it up. I'm not even talking about visually being able to follow the process. I'm just asking for the purpose of the regulation, there's time periods for survey and then there's time periods for make ready. I think the regulations kind of, maybe not naively, but I think the regulations presumed that there was this very <laughs> orderly process of, hey, it, it is either in survey or it has been received, it's in survey, it's in make ready, it's approved. There's, there, it's very clear in practice there are more than, there are more uh, statuses than that. But do you all have insight into any utility about when the survey begins and when the survey ends for at least purposes of, of understanding compliance with the regulation? I, I would say it's limited. In some cases we see it, in some cases we don't. Well, I, I, what I'm trying to ask is, is there any utility that you very clearly see it? No. Okay. Yes. Well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's in Catapult, right? Every status mm -hmm. changes. Every application goes through the, the status process. You can go in and see the status at any time of where it's at. So. You mean, it, 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 is that like two ships passing in the night kind of thing? No, that you I all, agree. You all didn't, weren't no. thinking about that one or something? I just no, curious. honestly, okay. I didn't include KU in the okay, conversation. That's okay. <laughs> I, was, I was more thinking the all no, one system. Okay. Okay. So with yeah. Catapult, yeah. though, that you can do that. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I feel like we've gotten to a okay. pretty good spot. And the, the main, and Heather and I have talked about this, the clock starts differently different for the times. two companies. And that seems to be a lot of difference in these numbers that we're seeing. As far as our progress and supporting Charter and what they need and our teams working, we're, you know, the high volume plan. And, and Mr. Chairman, you asked if the regulation is working. And I would, I would say for us, in this instance at least, you know, the high volume plan is the part of the regulation that was the answer to the gaps in the first two tiers. And Which that's basically, y'all can. But choose to do something different you, right? than what, what's prescribed here, but I, no, I but I mean only in the only in the high volume sense. I mean, no, it was not it was not intended to slight the 
the other part of the regulation. Oh, sorry, it I worked do, for the I lower numbers. I didn't do that work on it, so I, understand. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't take offense to it, Jeb, and, and some of the other folks internally, but I, we, you, you just don't know what you don't know. I, I understand. But, but you're saying the flexibility provided by the right. regulation yeah. in that instance helped fix the problem. I, I was just going to add that the same status is available in all of them. It's the same, it's the same thing. So but, you, so, but can't... But, can a person after the fact go and say it has been in survey for I don't know, 20 days at any given time? But, but you, you agree that we've had some difficulty accessing some records. We don't have the ability to pull reports. The data is not always kept up to date. I, I agree with so all that. I, I agree with all that yeah, and yeah, more, no, and my, I think and, I said and, that when I was speaking because I agree with it. Yeah, yeah, no, my, my, my question was, is it technically, it, or is it a technology issue is my, my primary question. I, that's I think it's a usability issue more than a technology okay. issue. The, the, the capability exists. Yes. That's fine. Yeah. So the capability exists. Mm -hmm. Practical implication is maybe not. If you all were like, this is crazy, it's been with somebody for so long, you all feel like, what I'm trying to find out is, is there even a record where the survey began and the survey in that is avail is conceptually available to the attachment. It sounds like as a general matter, yes. Now, practical implications aside, I, what, that's what I'm trying to find out. Is there even a record to say they are or they are not complying with the regulation in terms of the time period in which they have to do the survey? That was the basis of my question. Do you, do you all feel like as a general matter for the utilities we regulate that capability exists? The, the, the tool and the capability exist. But the data isn't there? Not all the time. Okay. Yeah. Does... I don't know. But, oh, go ahead. One more thought. I, I don't know. I don't know. Does every poll owner give us access to a system? No. Well, the ones on the chart do, like the higher volume, yes. So the people you absolute. care about. The people you care about. I, I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, I, the, the, I, I know <laughs> what matters to this conversation is what I'm trying to The people that matter to this conversation in terms of material volume, yeah, of, of material, not even high volume, material volume attachment for the purposes of expanding broadband service to unserved and underserved areas in the Commonwealth. The capability technically exists for those entities. Uh, for the poll owners we're working with today. Great. And the poll owners you expect to work with through 2026. I think we'll have to navigate that as we add some more into the fold at a higher volume than okay. what we experienced today. So that's due diligence. The, the answer we to have your question to is not an absolute. This is where yeah. I was going. Well, it's and very if, okay. If the data isn't there, do we know why the data wouldn't be there for them to see? So I, I think I think the data is there for them to see. Um, I think. As, as you've heard me repeat more times than you'd like, I think it took us all time to get up to speed with okay. the regulation, right? And I think in a lot of cases, um, there were lots of, of issues that prevented different parties from seeing the data, even in cases <laughs> when it was there. And I, and I think that's one of the things Jeff's referring to, so. Okay, so did you, have, did you or Chris, uh, Chris had to step up. Yeah. Oh, there you are. There. Yeah, it, and I wanted to just say a few things, uh, contemplating back to the consistency of construction. I mean, I, I really think that I would like to make a comment about that. Operationally, like I said, we're ramping up, and a lot of the ramp up right now is on the, the early part of the process. We're, we're continuing to add contractors as well. But, you know, bluegrass is a pretty good example. The Harrison County areas are a lot different than Jessamine County. And time of construction, can vary. I mean, I mean, there can be significant difference in build outs that have to be done and make ready work. So complex make ready work we talked about can take a significant amount of time on certain three phase structures all across Jessamine County, whereas potentially in Harrison and Robertson County, it's a very rural single phase search. You may Just, be it is what it is. I mean, it, but it could check 500 one month in Jessamine County may be an unbelievable amount of work where 500 in a rural part may not be so i'm just saying we got to be careful understanding that whole bit and then the other side of this for cooperatives we always got to think I'm, i can speak of one very well just over say 25 linemen if we have significant storms and tornadoes and events 
you know, I contemplated some of this when we were talking about the regulation years ago now, that everybody's going to be doing that work, getting the lights back on and dedicating a lot of those resources to broadband will probably take a back seat. I just, you got to be careful when we, we are thinking about all these different construction practices. Well, we, we, we would never tell you to yeah. not go restore service after a storm. Absolutely. But the rules say that in the supply space, it's 135 days for construction. Yeah. It doesn't say if it's in a more rural area that you get more time. It says 135 days. Well, and, and respect less time or more time. Yeah, right. You know, and respectfully, and I don't want to relive this, but when we were dealing with a major build out in New York State a few years ago as, as part of our merger commitment, unfortunately, there were major storms that happened in the country and in Puerto Rico at that point, right? When, when they had their major storm. And we received notifications from the poll owners that certain things were not going to happen pursuant to certain timelines, recognizing that concern. So, I mean, to the best of our knowledge, this timing is not a reflection of any of those things happening. I, I'm not saying, you know, God forbid that something is, is never going to happen and that things don't need, need to get managed around. But, you know, that is also a factor to us. If certain things are happening, we're sensitive to that, as Jeff said. We'll, we'll get notice and we'll manage accordingly, right? So we're not asking for people to do things that are kind of <laughs> against what is obviously what is good public policy. Right? So let, let me just take a big step back here. When we're talking, let's just let's just forget the. Okay. So we we've, we've got uh, we've got a couple of counties. We, you guys know where you're going. We're going to talk about that in a second. Yeah. You guys know where you're going. You got a couple of counties. You got a lot of utilities out there. Well, I, I take a step back. The KU High Volume contract that we talked about earlier is about applications received and a little bit about applications anticipated to be given over the next couple of months. It is not at all about new applications for projects that are not anticipated by any of this. Okay. Same thing with this. These are applications received, not anticipated applications for this chart. Are we trying to fix the problem that exists today? as a group or do you all anticipate that there will be far more attachment requests that are currently pending with LG and EKU or pending on this map? Because I take from a slide that happens in a second. Why don't we go to that slide, the two, yeah, that one. Uh, slide slide seven. Oh, I had seven, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it's the same, it's the same number. Yeah. But you, go, you, you mind to go more, more just so there are less rows and less columns, thank you. Yeah. So round two forecast, mm -hmm. round two forecast is, is the KU number, that's the 11, that's 2766 Divided that up. we're on the, okay, all right, okay. So round two forecast is worse than pending, right? At twice as many right. close. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there have only been 30, well, no, that's not correct. Do you all know uh, from your map on four, could you go back just for a second, Todd? Your map on four, you got, uh, of these numbers, you've got 33,595 applications approved, right? right. Or polls approved. Polls. Mm -hmm. Permits approved. Polls. polls. These are polls. Polls, okay. That's right. um, An application could have 50 polls. Right, I, I thought we were doing, permit is poll by poll. Uh, well, just, no. yeah, that's okay. These are polls. That's fine. This is I, I just want to apples to apples numbers here for a second. So thirty three thousand polls, thirty three and a half thousand polls. You've got a back a backlog pending. A pending of, that's fine. <laughs> of forty eight thousand, right? So you're not even halfway through the submitted. And nevertheless, you expect just as many in the round two forecast as submitted. Correct. So I just want to make sure that when we're having these conversations we're skating to where the puck's going and not where the puck is. So I'm, I'm frankly, mm -hmm. when I'm thinking of what the regulations maybe ought to be or what the tariffs ought to be, I care less about trying to process the applications we have now as opposed to making sure that we process the applications, period, both mm -hmm. that we have now and that we have in the future. So can somebody talk about what the expectations are for getting the KU high volume agreement what your all's thoughts are about what can be done to address the new polls while working on the backlog 
that is inherently different or lessons learned or whatever it may be, um, instead of just increasing the, I, I'll tell you, I'll be perfectly frank with the reason I'm asking the question is increasing the amount to, from a thousand to something else doesn't seem that necessarily going to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. So do you all have any thoughts about giving these round two forecasts and how you all expect to roll out, whether there are any suggestions you all have of necessarily helping us skate to where the puck is going as opposed to where it is while also taking care of what needs to be done now. I think it's going to have to be a breakdown. So we're in the walkout of that round two now, okay. right? So they're not signed, right? Okay. We expect them to be signed soon, right? Um, but we're in the walkout design phase of that now so that we can put those application packages together, if you will, right? Okay. So these are a forecast. The math is simply the, what we are awarded the miles in that county that we're awarded, 20 poles a mile, and what we expect that owner to have as a percentage. So I one want to say it is a very directional number. It is not a walkout and designed number. It is intended to be a forecast, right? And so I think, honestly, Chairman, from the conversations we've heard is that we're, we'll take this back with each individual owner and or engineering firm and say, do you want all of Harrison County as an example when we have it? Or do you want us to break it up into digestible pieces over six months? Right. It's that notice right. that's going to be important is what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. So okay. um, as soon as we have the walkout and the design and kind of the order of the builds, because again, one county, few counties have one owner, right, um, in there. So we've got to work congruently with multiple folks to build out a county. Okay. That's helpful. I have to step away, I'm sorry. Thank you all. I was about to say, it's it's past 1 o'clock. I anticipated running to about 1 o'clock, if, if that's okay. Are there any other matters people wish to discuss besides the fact I misspelled poll under poll numbers on the list of issues? Uh, it's been staring at me all day long. I didn't realize that. So apologies. Uh, I, was, I was in a rush to get things done. Uh, are there anything else that people would like to discuss at this moment before we... Not a discussion point, but just to note, we have already filed in the record the presentation from this morning. Yeah, got a notification of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Depp. Um, I don't know when our next meeting will be. I, I anticipate we probably have some uh, ongoing ones. I assume that people will still find these things to be beneficial. I think that you know, we're, we're plowing some new ground, and it helps the commission to get an idea of what's going on here. Uh, like I said, uh, the cooperatives have, have <coughs> offered to give a little field trip people to take a look at some of the issues. I think Mr. Depp filed that into the, the, the mention of that with their list of issues. And I'll coordinate with him to have that um, process through our meeting tracking process. We'll make sure that all the interested parties in this proceeding will get an opportunity to, to attend so we won't have any, you know, consideration, uh, ex parte considerations on the matter. Um, and that uh, just keep an eye out for everything else that might be ongoing. I appreciate everybody's time. Mike, thank you for coming down from Connecticut. There are some flowering uh, trees. Uh, we'll, we'll try to schedule the next one not around derby time uh, because that makes everybody else sad that it works in Louisville. But, uh, you know, we'll see if we can get it with a, maybe when some of the horses are running or something. So. I assume though, the timing could be impacted by what the legislature may yeah. not do once this resolution. I don't want to speak for the commission, but I anticipate that if the, there was a joint resolution which passed through the House this morning uh, is signed, the commission has, uh, as, as it's written, 60 days to promulgate emergency regulations. Um, I anticipate we'll be back sooner rather than later if that were to occur, Allison. So that's correct. Is it a full day the next time? Well, we'll see. Okay. The, the, the commissioner was yeah, the commissioner's asking if we want to do a full day the next time. Um, I think we'd have to anticipate more time than what we have here today uh, uh, for that. So we'll see. Commissioner, do you have anything else? I don't think so. Oh. Vice Chair? Okay, so. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And anyone who wants to meet Brian, I'm going to go yeah, get our, our new. If you want to meet our new general counsel, you can general stick counsel. around. Thank you all. Thank you.